Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the broadcast. I'm sorry that I'm late. My green screen decided to mess up. So here we are. I had to fix the green screen. I told my wife today, she said, why do you always go late a few minutes like after six or you're 608 or 609 or 610? And I told her the moment I'm going to go live, something always goes wrong. So that is why I get on here late. I'm always trying to fix something last minute and I don't have an intro. So the five minute stalling, getting people in. Yeah, I don't have an intro. So here we are. If you didn't know, we are reacting to a documentary made about me. This is called uh, Isaiah Saldivar, The Making of a Minister by Honest Youth Pastor is who made it. And really quick, just so you guys know, I didn't make this documentary. So for those of you asking if I'm gonna react to a documentary I made about myself, no, I did not make this documentary. Someone else made this documentary. I was not a part of it. I didn't know that they were making it. I don't know the person personally, but I saw that they posted it. Friends were texting me like, did you know there's a documentary about you? And I was super busy the day it was posted. I didn't get a chance to watch it. And I thought, you know what? I'll watch it on stream. So this is my first time watching it. I skimmed through it, but I didn't watch it. So a lot of the stuff's gonna be new. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. This is gonna be a struggle for me tonight. Because if you don't know, I don't like watching my stuff. I don't watch back any of my videos. I don't sit and watch any of my own sermons. So the hardest part for me is going to be watching myself talk and watching myself preach and whatever else is in this documentary. But hopefully I can fill in any blanks or whatever might be wrong. I can fill in the blanks with you guys and fill in the gaps. And I'm guessing he used all info found online because obviously I wasn't a part of it. So I didn't give him any info. So I'm guessing all the information he found was in information you can find on the internet. But I just wanted to make it clear that Honest Youth Pastor is the one that made it. I did not make this documentary. One Now, when the video got posted, here's the thing about the YouTube algorithm. The YouTube algorithm is so good at showing the audience, your audience, your content. So I think the first like 200 comments, because I did read the comments the first day it was posted before I went live on my stream, which was a mistake. I shouldn't have been reading the comments. But they were mostly all negative, And that's because his audience, for the most part, is reform, cessationist, um, anti-charismatic let's just say that I, I know he's been critical of me in the past and some of my sermon reviews he's been critical of so his audience does not like me let's just put it that way and you can know this by the comments until i posted about this then you guys went and added positive comments but let's just tell you the comments were basically this guy seems like he's having a manic, ep manic episode this guy's demon possessed this guy needs to repent and then one comment i kept seeing over and over was he's obsessed with himself he has main character syndrome but here's the irony of it all this documentary is covering my testimony. So I want to say it's like three different videos put together of my testimony. So yes, of course, it's about me. Like if I give an hour and a half of my testimony, of course, it's going to be like, this guy's talking about himself a lot. Yeah, the testimony is my testimony. So anyways, I just wanted to point that out because I thought it was ironic that people were like main character syndrome. And I'm like, bro, you're, you're watching an hour and a half documentary about me. Of course, it's going to be about me. Of course, it's going to be talking about my ministry. The videos are about my testimony. So I did want to say that because I saw a lot of those comments of like, this guy is really full of himself, main character syndrome. And uh, I was laughing because I said, all right, well, the documentary is about me. And the testimony that the documentary covers was about me. And I think he goes through my journal, which is oh, cringe in my mind because I, I, I have it all on my channel. So it wasn't like he pulled up secret information. The testimony on my channel has my journal entries. I think it's a testimony with Vlad. So this is all public information here that he goes over. It still does feel a little bit uh, weird that somebody made an hour and 23 minute documentary about me. I don't know. I told one person like, should I feel flattered or should I feel violated? I feel I'm mixed on it, but we'll watch it and see. Um, we'll watch it and see. But yeah, I know no secret. The cessationists and the reform community does not like me, uh, of course. So that's not a secret. I'm not shocked by the negative comments on the video or anything like that. It's to be expected. But yeah, it's just weird how how vile some people can be, especially when we agree on all the primaries. We might disagree on secondary issues, but we agree on all the primary issues of the faith. So I think there's just a lot of unnecessary hate in the Christian community. That's another video another day. We're going to watch this together. I'll give you my comments. I'll pause it as we go. So if you don't like me pausing it, go watch the original video. Don't watch this reaction. Okay, don't be in the comments saying, why are you talking and pausing it? This is a reaction video. So just a heads up. I will pause it when necessary. Pray for me because I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous because I haven't seen this and I'm watching it live. This might be this might be a little bit of a gamble here watching this live for the first time. But a lot of people that watched it told me it's unbiased. They felt it was unbiased. It's not a hit piece according to the description. So we're going to watch it together. I don't feel like this is like a heresy hunter video or anything like that, which I usually won't respond to those or watch them. But let's just watch it together and be open minded. And again, I know this took a lot of work for the guy that made this. So 
I have to commend him on that. I can't imagine an hour and 23 minutes of video footage and looking through my stuff. I mean, this is a lot of work to put this together. So I have to say that. And I know a lot of people in the chat are saying this. I thought it was good. So we'll see. Here we go. This is Isaiah Salvar, The Making of a Minister. And again, guys, the documentary is about me. So don't be like, oh, you're talking about yourself a lot. That's literally my, it's literally my testimony. So here we go. And in that moment, I said that, again, an atheist didn't believe, the audible voice of God. We're not talking about a small voice. We're not talking about an inward. The audible voice of God from heaven said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. I want everything. If you have heard of Isaiah Saldivar, it's very likely it's because of his connection to the Demon Slayers, Deliverance Ministry, and his very fiery brand of charismatic preaching. Have this generation, we are going to stand against the powers and the principalities and the rulers of this world. In fact, he came on the scene in 2022, most people, because of his YouTube channel and the topics he covers on there that most people don't talk about at all. And if you haven't heard of him, that's probably why. Ladies, Isaiah I'm not gonna lie, this is a good intro. The the voiceover, the music, the editing, it, it's pretty good. I like the intro so far. It belongs to what to I would broadcast. classify as a new sort of section of internet influencing pastors that really didn't necessarily start on the internet, but begin to get a lot of traction and influence and followers around the 2020 shutdown. Watch your videos every day in my living room. Like we're going directly now into people's living rooms, into people's homes and preaching the most powerful message in human history. And we will, at the end of the video, get into the more controversial things that he said and controversial, we'll see the controversial things about his ministry. But it's important to know before we get there that his ministry actually started a decade ago in his parents. I mean, I literally cast our demons, so my whole ministry is controversial. Prince living room in California. Isaiah was born to a Janelle and Nick Saldivar. In fact, his entire name is Isaiah Luke Saldivar. And Isaiah was born on March 12th, 1988 into an attack. No, 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 no. He's using, um, he's using Google. Oh man. I hope he doesn't try to say my net worth is like $12 million. I was definitely not born in March 12th, 1988. That is Google. And I think it all, that same page also says I'm like five, seven. So I was born, I was born May 29th, 1991. So yeah, it's all good. Listen. He made the documentary based on what he found online, but I'm just hoping that we don't, we don't get too much Google on here. It's uh, May 29th, 1991, but it's okay. Again, I'll fill in any blanks and uh, it'll be good. Italian slash Spanish family. He was the third of four children. Well, what's your siblings names? So Nico's the oldest, then Sunshine, then Isaiah, then Cherish. And then and we have an adopted names. younger sister, Juliana. Isaiah was a- This is a lot of work, y'all. I have to commend him. I have to commend him. This is a lot of work to find clips and put all this together. Like as a video editor and content creator, I know this took tens, tens and tens of hours to make this. A church kid. He grew up in church, but he would classify it as not a spirit filled church. Never understood when I was in the world as an atheist, people thought I'd just come to church and I'd go to church and I'd always be like, it's so boring. Nobody's excited. By the time he had finished homeschooling at 16, he was really sort of done with church altogether. He and a friend of mine, we all went to church and I'll never forget. So I'm about to walk in the church and I tell myself this, in my head, I say, this will be the last time I ever step foot in church, right? This is three wow. years of not going to church. And I've been raised in church. I went to all the vacation Bible schools, all the mm -hmm. purity conferences, my whole life in church. And then here I am now, years not going. And I said to myself, before walking through the door of the church in Modesto, California, mm -hmm. uh, Calvary Temple, now it's called the house. I said, I'll never step foot in the door of a church again. This will be the last night I ever step foot in a church again. Isaiah's entire goal in life was to go to college and major in the criminal justice field to become a police officer. He had a girlfriend at the time that he planned on marrying, and he thought his entire life was on track, working at Starbucks with his sister Cherish as he went to college. Okay, so I was in the metal band, become a but that is not me on the drums. That's actually a guy named Dom. When the towards starting college, I couldn't be in a band, go on tour, do all that, and be in college and focus on college. So I decided to leave the band I started, which I started it when I was, I think, 13. I left the band I started. They got a new drummer and that lasted maybe a month or two. They did one of their final shows and then the band broke up. So the guy on stage is actually not me on the drums. It's a guy named Dom. Um, but there is footage out there of me on the drums at, at these metal shows. It's just very hard to find. But yeah, that's not me on the drums.
of a police officer, spending much of his free time playing in a metal band called Ourselves Among Others. Have you ever thought about using your rock singing voice to worship the Lord? I didn't sing, I played drums. What metal band were you in? Uh, it was called Ourselves Among Others. We still have some music up on my- Now this music he's playing actually is, is my band, but that was not me on stage. MySpace, Ser seriously. And I think SoundCloud. All of this began to change, however, without Isaiah actually knowing it, when his sister Cherish invited him to church. And so my sister, for about six months, is bugging me to go to church. Isaiah, you gotta go to church. Isaiah, you gotta go to church. This church that I'm inviting you to, you're gonna feel God, you're gonna experience God. I thought she was crazy, because I never understood that God could be felt, God could be experienced. I just thought God was some religious thing that you just pray to and does nothing. I thought, you know, when you're weak, you go to church. You know, to me, Christians, they dressed funny, they smelled weird, and I didn't really want nothing nothing to do with God. And so I was just like, no, I don't want to go. So for about, I don't know, four, now I'll use some uh, vagueness as much as I can because I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to lie. So it was probably four to six months. I don't want to say an exact time, but it was probably four, between four and six months. My sister begged me, Isaiah, just go to church, go to church. And I'm like, there's no chance. There's no chance. Isaiah Saladivar is going to go to church. This is so hard for me to watch myself talk, y'all. <laughs> We're only four minutes in the struggles are out here. I'm just going to let it play. My mind was this. What do I need from God? In fact, she bugged him so much, he eventually convinced his girlfriend to just go one time with him to satisfy his sister's request. So on January 12th, 2011, Isaiah takes the 25 minute car ride to Calvary Temple, now called The House in Modesto, California. So I just feel honored that- He I does have a lot of facts correct, just so you guys know. I mean, like I said, I have to commend him again. That is so, that's a lot of work to, to get all these facts and everything like that. So I'm, I don't want to be hard on him and be like, this was wrong, this was wrong. He has a lot of facts that are, are, are right on this. And, and that's a lot of work that he had to dig through and find and stuff like that. I was able to even be a part of your story, let alone mm. be the one that took you to church. But there were so many laborers for you, like yes. mom, dad, grandma, Nino, Nina, like all these people that have been praying for him since he was born. And I got to do the fun part of like bringing you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that night completely changed Isaiah's life. Isaiah recounts that while he was sitting there during the worship set, he was actually making sexual jokes about the youth pastor's wife, which happened to be the one singing on stage. Even in the message, Isaiah wasn't paying a lot of attention at all. He knew it was about world missions and going out, but other than that, not a lot of attention was paid. So we go to this church and seats, I don't know, maybe 2,000. He's honestly telling my testimony better than I tell him, I'm not gonna lie. 1,000 people maybe 3,000. I sit in the very back. I really don't want nothing to do with God. I'm making to my friend next to me sexual jokes about the worship leader who is, I didn't know, was the pastor's wife. And so I'm making sexual jokes about the people doing worship on stage. That's how far I was and how distant I was from God. So my friend's on my right, my girlfriend's on my left, and I'm kind of sitting there, not interested. A, a man named Jason Nettles, who's a good friend of mine now, is preaching this message about world missions. After the preacher got done preaching, I felt, now this might strike some unbelief in the audience here, but I felt something pulling on me, as if you were grabbing my shirt and pulling me to the altar. Now, I didn't know what it was. I just knew something is pulling me, and I, I couldn't fight it to go to the altar. And I went forward to that altar and I stood there and I said something that's gonna make a lot of religious people upset right here. I said, God, I don't effing believe in you. I actually cussed at God, I didn't know. Now Isaiah claims that during the time he was up at the altar, he doesn't remember how long it was. Rather, he says that he remembers God speaking to him in an audible voice. Tell Vlad said, how does it feel listening to yourself? It feels weird. I never watch myself, like at all, ever. I don't ever watch my replays, none of that. And uh, yeah, I'm just, praise the Lord, give me patience, Lord. It's weird hearing myself. Telling him that he was going to go out into the world, that he was going to go. But I do like the commentary the guy, this guy, um, honest youth pastor is giving. It is, uh, it's a good commentary. Preach the gospel in his name. And that at the same time, dirt began to come out of his eyes. And in that moment, I said that, again, an atheist didn't believe, the audible voice of God. We're not talking about a small voice. We're not talking about an inward. The audible voice of God from heaven said, Isaiah, I don't want 99.9% .9 of you. I want everything. And if you give me my, your life, I will use you to preach my gospel to all nations. And God, I, I was in a trance-like state. I wasn't, I didn't feel I was at the altar anymore. I was in, it was, I just saw glowing bright lights. Like I was in another dimension and I just heard the Lord speak to me and God began to show me in visions. Everything I'm doing right now, I saw 10 years ago, the traveling, the preaching, the miracles, the deliverances, revival in my home. I started seeing that that night. Um, one thing that I wanted to say that was very incredible that began to happen. When I came out of this vision, 
literal dirt started coming out of my eyes. I'm not talking spiritual. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. in the spirit. I'm a, I was an atheist five seconds ago. Dirt was coming out of my eyes and God began to remove the dirty scales that the world and, and lust and everything had put on me. And I was born again, speaking in tongues, trying to cover my mouth so my girlfriend wouldn't hear. I mean, no one was laying hands on me. I didn't know what it was. I had only heard tongues one time in my life. Mm. And now I'm sitting there oh, speaking violently in tongues and the Holy Spirit just really changed my life. All this to say that this apparently lasts an hour or more. As this is happening, I'm getting visions, I'm seeing lights, I'm in like this trance, I don't know vision or what it was. I'm, I'm there at the altar, you know, it's like when you get lost in the spirit, an hour goes by and it's like, feels like it's a minute. So I thought I was at the altar for a minute. I, I'm crying, I'm feeling something surging. I was laughing at some of the comments on the video of like, this must have been a demon that encountered him. This guy's demon possessed, he talks fast. I was like, brother. It's not being demon possessed to talk fast, it's called being Italian. And secondly, if you think what happened to me is crazy, you haven't read the Bible long enough. Because the Bible, as Pastor Mike always says, isn't the story of what God did, it's the story of what God always does. I love that quote, and I probably misquoted that. But yeah, I mean, I was an atheist, so people were like, I don't believe your experience. Like, okay, cool. I'm not an atheist anymore. I was before, now I'm not. So I don't know if a demon would do that or not, but uh, yeah, I don't think demons are out here making people preach the gospel for 13 years. But it's just funny how people equate talking fast to, he must not know the Bible. It's like Over so my early. body, I'm getting visions of all these end times, me preaching on stages, God speaking to me, saying, I'm going to use you, I'm going to raise you up, I'm going to anoint you as a prophet, you're going to travel, you're going to preach, and I'm going, I'm just overwhelmed. So and after he gets up from the altar, he says that no one looks the same. In fact, the only person he recognizes is his sister, Cherish, and he says he has to go home. So I come out of this vision, and all I can say, guys, is I didn't recognize anybody. I didn't recognize anything. I didn't recognize anyone. Again, I get emotional talking about, it, but it was, it was, it was, I was born again. I was a new person. The old Isaiah didn't exist anymore. He was completely wiped off the face of the earth. It was a funeral that night for Isaiah and it was a birth for the new man. And I was, I was frantic because I, I didn't recognize anybody. When I say I didn't recognize anybody, I really do mean that. And so I was kind of like, they turned the lights on and I'm kind of like panicking, what is going on? And you know, the people that came with me, like my girlfriend looked different, my friend looked different, everybody looked different. I just didn't recognize. The blue on the walls didn't look like blue. The greens didn't look like green. And my sister said, hey, are you okay? Um, what, what's going on with you? I was like, I don't know. I just know I need to get home. I don't know what's going on with me. Mm. Whatever just happened to me, I don't ever want it to leave. And so I automatically connected this holy shout out to vlad in the chat a experience because that's what happens when the holy ghost mm -hmm. comes upon you you feel unholy mm -hmm. and i felt extremely unholy at that altar every as i got that encounter with the that's holy crazy. spirit and i was born again mm -hmm. i put my faith in jesus i looked at what he did on the cross i mm -hmm. accepted his salvation work of the cross i repented truly of my sins mm -hmm. that moment at the altar i felt so unclean as god began now let's ask ourselves does a demon if i encountered a demon does a demon make you repent of your sins to walk. I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm just I read a lot of negative comments uh, on this video when it first got posted So I'm just being a little defensive, but I'll stop. Mm. I realized that your audio upgraded so much from then Well, I don't know why my audio sounds so bad on this interview here, but uh, Yeah, something was going on with the program I don't know the misery of my sin and the the worthlessness of everything I've been doing and I felt instant conviction sounds like I got saved underwater like the crusty crab I don't know what the audio is something on this video the drinking was wrong. The cussing was wow. wrong. The smoking was wrong. The pornography was wrong. The sleeping with my girlfriend was wrong. The video games were wrong. Everything I felt instantly. So when I went home, I started purging everything. The next day, Isaiah claims that he gets up to go to college. And as he's in class, he begins to receive prophetic words of knowledge about people sitting next to him. He starts to see demons above other people. And he begins to prophesy over absolutely everything and everyone he comes in contact with. I go to college the next day after not sleeping. I'm seeing demons and angels all over my college campus. So mind you, I go from being this atheist to the next day. I remember driving to college on the freeway. I pulled over on the freeway and I'm on the side of the freeway bawling like a baby I'm on the side of the road going why am I crying and I'm at college I'm seeing demons and angels and I remember sitting in my college class and I'm hearing the thoughts of the guy next to me I'm getting a word of knowledge now I didn't know about word of knowledge I didn't know about prophecy so I literally thought I'm sitting in college the next day and I'm getting a word of knowledge for the guy next to me about his life and his dad and some abuse he went through and I'm like 
I think I woke up a psychic. I think the devil entered me because I didn't know what word of knowledge or prophecy was. So I just thought, you know, maybe I'm a psychic. I don't know what's going on. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting thoughts and I'm seeing things and I'm having these spiritual encounters. And I am in college the first day ever I left college early. This obviously alarms his family. His family actually keeps him home for the following days as he doesn't sleep and begins to talk incessantly about the things that God has called him to do and the things he is prophesying about the world and what is happening currently. I'm day after day after day talking for 12 hours straight, 14 hours. They had to baby, they had to- Guys, if you think I talk fast now, when I first got saved, I talked 10X what I talk now. You cannot understand me, I talked so fast I pretty much needed someone to interpret who was my uncle because I was just nonstop talking. But yeah, God rocked my world. I mean, everything I'm saying, it really happened. And I have a journal that recollects all of this that reminds me that, wow, this was crazy. It really did happen. To take shifts to watch me. I'm not kidding. My mom, my dad, my uncle, my sister, they would take turns watching me because I would just talk for 12 to 14 hours. And there's something I used to do. Some of the stuff I'm going to share is cringe, guys. But it's remember, I just, it's so hard to listen to, but it's my early days. You know what I mean? If some of you look back, but yeah, some of the stuff out of my journal is so cringe, but I was just saved. I didn't know how to like, ver like make any words out of anything. I was just saying the craziest stuff. Um, some of it I didn't even read, but I was like a brand new Christian and I was like a baby. Babies sound crazy sometimes, you know, they say some wild stuff. I was gonna say, but I used to always do this thing where when I would talk, I would put my hand like this. I would be like, God is coming back. God is real. God is moving in our family. And they would be like, why are you doing that with my hand, your hand? And I would always say, whenever I use my hand like this, God is speaking through me. And the funny part is now I'm starting to see why I'm starting to see why the cessationist reform people had some negative things to say about this, about my testimony is now I always go like this when I preach. And so it's like, I almost still do that, but I used to always go like this, you know, God is coming out and, and they would say, why are you doing that with your hand? And I would like, whenever I do this, God is speaking out of me. My family doesn't know what to do with me. Everyone's like, what is going on with Isaiah? Something's happening with him. Well, at the time I had, and I'm telling everybody, you know, God is coming back tomorrow. God is real. I'm getting words of knowledge from my family telling them this happened to you. I had no filter. I mean, they were literally scared to take me out in public. Because I was prophesying, I would walk up to random people and be like, at four years old, this happened to you. God wants to heal you. I'd be in the middle of Save Mart. And they're like, what? You can't say that, Isaiah. I'm prophesying over our animals. I'm not kidding, guys. I was so radical, so sold out. I went home, deleted 40,000. For those of you asking why the screen is not filled, that's the um, actual documentary. My screen's full. So those of you that keep asking, why is it not full screen? It is full screen right now. It's just the documentary. For some reason, the borders are cut off. Thousand songs off my iTunes, broke all my video games, broke all my music. I was just going all out because I knew God had done something in me and I didn't want to lose what God was doing. Now, obviously, the first few days of Isaiah's salvation were dramatically different for him, radically changed. Isaiah actually journals about the things he was seeing and praying about. January 12th. This is so wild. These journal entries. Again, guys, I want to say for those of you that are like, I can't believe this guy, he's just getting uh, this from my, my channel. This is on my channel. This is not like secret information he's digging up. Uh, these journal entries and this is my testimony on my channel. And yeah, this was very hard to read and go through, but it brings back so many old memories. It's super authentic and genuine. And uh, it was me as a newborn Christian. I got radically saved. And so I think it's beautiful when I go through my journal, even though I cringe out and I'm like, I can't believe I said this it's still, there's a side of it like, wow, I can't believe where God brought me from. And just the purity of when I first got saved is amazing. I would love to go back for just like 10 minutes to that day um, because it was just life-changing. I get emotional even thinking about it, but yeah, anyways. So yeah, don't don't be like bashing people in the comments. He literally got this from my channel, from my testimony video. 2011, today my life got flipped upside down. I finally gave everything to God and he overwhelmed me with the Holy- This is the night I got saved. So this is pretty crazy. I wrote this in my journal the night I got saved, January 12, 2011. Spirit, he showed me what my future would be. I am an end time warrior. He gave me a vision. I was in North Korea on the front lines of an army of spiritual warriors. Everything was black and white. And as he poured out the Holy Spirit, color began to come back into the people's faces. The despair of the people there was something like I've never seen. I did not realize how life-changing this was till now. This was my first vision. The first time I seen my calling, my destiny, my life, me preaching, before people. I would change millions of lives. This night, I got new eyes after church. I couldn't recognize anyone or anything. The dirty scales have been removed. January 13th, 2011. Wow, I'm starting to feel the Holy Spirit. His presence is more than I can imagine or handle. My mindset is fresh. 
I can't see anything the same. The old me has gotten wiped off the earth. I'm at school seeing the power of God everywhere. I'm looking around for lost souls. I'm understanding my calling and my purpose. It's almost so intense for me to bear. I'm craving prophecy, but the Lord is saying, be patient. January 14th, 2011. My life is changing so fast. God is showing me so much and I'm still trying to control all this prophetic power and all these gifts he's entrusted in me. This is something like I've never experienced before. January 15th, 2011. I stayed up all night again, speaking about the Holy Spirit and trying to understand. I had two very important dreams of the future. The first dream, I was looking at a sea of people and I was hearing their thoughts and it was happening in seconds. God was stressing that this was fast. I seen their entire- Remember guys, I'm saved like three days here. So just for context, I'm saved three days when I wrote this. I was an atheist three days ago, four days ago, three and a half days ago. I was at a beer pong tournament 15 days. On New Year's of 2010, I was at a beer pong tournament at a friend's house. So 15 days later, I go from being at a beer pong tournament to this. So that's how like radical the encounter was. Entire lives in seconds. The second dream, there was a sea of diverse people. Each person had a cord connected to them. They were all connected. God is showing me that there are people that are all over the world connected somehow spiritually. I'm still trying to figure it out. This day, the- And I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm like, oh, that sounds a little bit new age-ish, but who knows what God was showing me, you know? That's how I verbalized it. But anyways, it's just, it's so funny because again, this is like a three day old Christian trying to figure out what God's showing him. Lord was testing me with old desires. And yeah, and this is not my handwriting for those in the chat asking. This is the editing. My handwriting is, is not this good. My wife's in the chat saying, this is definitely not his handwriting. My hand, I got doctor's handwriting. Let's just say that. If you know, you know. He told me if I give in, you will lose everything. He told me as fast as I've given you all this is as fast as you can lose it if you give in to temptations. January 16th, I stayed up all night again. I talked about God all night. And I got, uh, and I received the power of prophecy. I'm supposed to go to Fresno, but I have a horrible feeling about it. Like I'm going to war. I was supposed to go, I don't know if I say this, but I was supposed to go to Fresno with the girl that I was pretty much living with that I was dating for four years. And I pretty much knew that if I went and stayed with her in Fresno, uh, yeah, I would basically backslide and, and probably not be serving God today. So that's what this is all about. War. Tonight I'll be tested, but I'm ready to pass the test. God intervened and I didn't go to Fresno, but I found out the girl that I've been with for four years is my downfall who quenches my fire. It's the hardest test yet, but I must press on with God's call. I was with this girl for four years, planned to marry her. Her parents called me their son. Uh, we pretty much lived together. So yeah, this was a pretty crazy, crazy time. Well, if I do what he asked fast, the power of God will be potent. January 17th, 2011. It's been two days of no sleep. That's how intense the Holy Spirit has been. Tonight, God told me that we must pray. I broke up with Mackenzie like God has asked me to, and I'm ready for his blessings. Prayer was incredible. God used me to cast out 24 demons. The spirit is increasing. God showed me I will be mocked and killed for the gospel, but I'm ready for that sacrifice. He showed me his power today. Thank you, God. Eventually, good thing I just got life insurance too. Literally, I just got life insurance a few days ago. So. His family contacts his uncle, Ben, which is also in ministry and currently in New York. Ben comes back, sits down with Isaiah and asks him, well, if this is true, what is the next thing the Lord has you doing? And Isaiah says, revival and prayer. Well, you don't understand. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. We're an end time army. And he's like, what is going on? And all my family's calling him. We don't know what happened to Isaiah. Something happened to Isaiah. He's not the same. He won't sleep. He won't eat. He's talking about end times, revival, last days, fivefold ministry, all these things. So they call him. They're like, you need to get you need to get home. There's something going on with Isaiah. And he's like, I'll be home soon. They're like, no, you need to get home now. Something happened to Isaiah. It was only a few short days after Isaiah's salvation did he decide to start a prayer meeting at his house. It had first started with friends and family. And now because of word of mouth, it was expanding outward. And he said, I, he, this is what he would tell me. Okay. God has raised you up. Mm -hmm. to reach this generation they think fast they talk mm -hmm. fast they're fast paced so that's how i always was and i thank god for him and like you said he poured into me mm -hmm. he didn't extinguish my fire and while isaiah had clearly already been experiencing the supernatural as he would state he asked his uncle ben or nino as he also calls him about a specific bible verse and this seems to be the pivot point at the very beginning of isaiah's ministry to go forward with this idea i remember one day Vlad telling my uncle, I looked at Mark, the book of Mark, and I said, wait, the disciples are casting out demons. Mm -hmm. They're healing the sick. They're raising the dead. And I said, can we do these things? And he said that 
in his mind, because he was involved in a mega church, 30 years of organized religion. He said in his mind, he knew he could either neuter me right there and say, no, we can't do none of that. Or say, Isaiah, everything in this book we have access to. Wow. Everything that God said in this book, we can do. And he told Come me that on. day, everything we can do. And so we started doing what was in the Bible. Come on. We didn't have this like, well, uh -huh. you know, brother, you need to go through four years of cemetery. I mean, seminary. <laughs> oh, yeah, brother, you need to go through this or that. Mm -hmm. We just knew. The Bible, it was in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my friends were getting sick. January 19th, 2011. Wow, I was late to work. I slept for one hour, but I don't even care. The physical pain I'm in is unbearable. I have demons living in me. This is right before I got delivered. My little sister cast demons out of me. Um, yeah, it was a pretty crazy story. It's not possession, but I'm afflicted. I'm seeing so much prophecy. Everyone I look at, God has given me a word for. I prophesied to my sister and God told me it's time for her breakthrough. She casted four demons out of me and it's her first time in the power of God. Thank God for letting me help her. As you can tell, I'm uh, a week saved. I don't even know half the words, like how to put them together. I'm like, it's her first time in the power of God. I'm trying to say like, it's her first time, you know, functioning and casting out demons. But anyways, it's just funny because again, uh, I'm a saved a week and I don't know how to put the words together. So it's funny to listen to First there is one more demon that must come out. This is warfare tonight was unreal I felt the power of God. Thank you. God. I've been delivered yeah, so revival, I got, I got delivered right before the revival broke out It okay. was a couple days after getting saved I would be sharing my faith and I would feel something like wanting to come out of my throat like a scratch And my sister's in the chat. She could testify. She said I remember that day clearly uh, She could testify to when she did deliverance on me. It was crazy crazy in a good way you're like uh -huh. wanting to cough and i knew there was something there i'm like something's in me i don't know mm. what this is i was getting super weird random bizarre demented thoughts that mm -hmm. i knew i'm like these thoughts are not my thoughts mm. i've never even when i was in the world i never had these thoughts wow. these are not my thoughts there has to be something there and then of course i'm reading the bible i'm like oh there's demons okay there must be a demon in me wanting to come out of me so i mm -hmm. actually tried doing self-deliverance in the parking lot of my college i was in my car because this thing was like trying to come out of me mm -hmm. it didn't want to this is honest youth pastor um, it's not the honest, it's honest. I believe it's honest youth pastor. Yeah, honest youth pastor. So those of you asking, he keeps asking over and over again who made it, it's honest youth pastor. Be in me. And I, he, he has a channel as well. I couldn't get this thing out. So I go home and I tell my little sister, you're gonna do deliverance on me. Cause again, I didn't have, I didn't know who else would do it. It was just me and my little sister and my uncle. Uh -huh. And she's like, what? I said, yeah, you're gonna cast all these demons out of me. And these were spirits of shame, uh -huh. of perversion, of lust. January 20th, 2011. God moved mountains today. I spoke it to 500 kids. It was amazing. The breakthroughs in my friends and family are overwhelmed. Now, as Isaiah is trying to process the spiritual nature of what he's going through, he also has some spiritual encounters at work. But I remember even like one time I was at my job, I was so radically saved. And when you get radically saved, you all think like the world's ending tomorrow. And I remember being at Starbucks, we literally at Starbucks prayed for everybody. You could ask my manager. Uh, we were praying for people at the drive-thru. I was going out being like, oh, let me just pull you around and get your coffee. It's taking a little long to make. And I would be running out there praying for them. And my manager's like, dude, you can't keep running out to people's cars praying for them. You can't keep praying for people through the drive-thru. You guys can't stay here all night because we were opening the store. I would open the store at like 3.30 a.m. Starbucks. And then at 4, we would like open the whole store. But I had to open with two other employees. We were like having Bible studies all night, staying in the store, having Bible studies all night. And he's like, you can't stay out all night in the store. You can't come super early. So anyways, we were just having like revival at uh, Starbucks. It was incredible. And a lot of people that got saved that I worked with are actually still saved to this day. Some of them are still in our ministry. And there's been a lot of great fruit from, from revival that happened at Starbucks. I was praying for people in the drive-thru. Literally everyone at my job pretty much got saved. I was laying hands. We were seeing demons cast out. We were preaching at Starbucks. And we literally took over that Starbucks. And I remember one day thinking, I'm going to quit my job. I even called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm quitting my job because... God is telling me to put a potato sack on. I literally had an image of myself wearing a John. True story, it's so cringe. I'm the Baptist potato sack, but I thought, I thought I was going to wear this potato sack and go on the corner of Main Street and Yosemite by Walmart and preach that end was coming. Now, somewhere between the 20th and the 25th of January 2011, they hold their first meeting officially and 50 people show up. January 25th, 2011. God is moving so fast, I can't even keep up with journaling. The first prayer meeting we had, 50 people showed up and God moved. It's still all unreal, but I love it. Feelings I've never felt and people I've never met all day. I had a prophetic dream. It was the end of the world and I kept yelling, use the power of God, the end is here. I'm having insane end time dreams every- Was it pre-trib or post-trib? Who knows? Sounds a little post-trib to me. 
If you know, you know. Every night, they're hard to decipher. I don't want to lose my fire. There's so much at risk. One week and so much stuff has changed. Thank you, God. This is war. P.S. The devil is alive. Someone said, do they make long sleeve potato sacks? You already know I got to have a custom long sleeve potato sack. We don't do short sleeves out here. Even with the initial success of the prayer meeting, Isaiah is facing some hurdles in his life. However, these challenges he sees as part of a spiritual war that he is fighting against the devil. January 26th. Today was amazing. My cousin got completely transformed. Thank you, God, for fulfilling your promise. I prophesied to someone at the gym, and he's hungry for God. Every day is one step closer to my destiny. Nothing can stop me. January 27, 2011. Today was probably the most challenging. He did a really good job on these, uh, on these these uh, little journals of the page turn and the on screen. He did a good, uh, he did a good job on this. Since my life got changed, my school drains me. I think this whole McKenzie situation is about to hit me. Time to pray for an hour and go to sleep. I have to press on. January 20, I was literally writing like, <laughs> listen, I'm not making fun of myself. Okay, I know you guys like, don't make fun of yourself, Isaiah. But I'm over here writing like it's like 1940 and I'm like in the Cold War. I'm in like a foxhole and I'm like, this is my last letter home. We're surrounded by the enemy. There's men all over, you know, it's like so funny. It's like every journal entry is like my last journal entry ever. I'm like, mom, just know I love you. It's just, it's so funny how I'm, I'm writing these like so intense warfare here, but it was, it was. And again, anyways, I don't want to take anything away from what God did in my early days. The 8th, 2011. Today was rough. The devil's using everyone in every Press on, brother. We got to press on and take more territory. Everything against me. The Lord has given me clear understanding to see who he is using. God is stripping everything from me and preparing me for my destiny. The world is calling and it starts in Hawaii. I'm seeing people. In <laughs> it starts in Hawaii. I'm down. Lord, send me. We actually have a friend with a church in Hawaii and they're like, when are you going to come? I'm like, send me Lord to Hawaii. Lord, the Lord still hasn't sent me to Hawaii, but I, here I am. It starts in Hawaii. I'm still waiting. I'm ready. Uh, Whatever the Lord leads me out there, I'm ready to go. I want a new light and it's overwhelming, but it's necessary. The intimacy with God is what refuels me. This is war. Somewhere around this time, the daily prayers that were occurring in Isaiah's house transform into a Monday night revival in which anywhere between 50 and 70 people continue to come. February 7th, 2011. Monday night was amazing. I slayed nine people in the whole- See, this is, this is, I just got saved, y'all. I would never write this now. I slayed nine people in the Holy Spirit. Like, that's- Cringe alert. <laughs> Holy Spirit. God kept showing up and showing off. I can feel the anointing stronger. About 70 people came tonight, and I got five prophecies that were all confirmed about me being a chosen vessel of God. And one prophecy was about. I listen. God's the one that does the work, not us, okay? Again, I was saved not even a month here, guys. Cut me a break, all right? Persecution. So, so cringe. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're like, don't say it's cringe. Let me just, let me just talk about myself for a minute. But I'm not afraid. I don't serve a God of doubt or fear, but of love and war. I will go to barren lands and preach the- Someone said slay, sister. No. The word. I will die for God. I'm ready to suffer, to change lives. The Bible didn't <sighs> say living for God is easy. I'm ready. It is also around this time that Isaiah writes in his journal that he has a bit of aggravation with the reality that he sees in front of him and the reality that the church acknowledges, namely demons being cast out. February uh, 9th, 2011. Crazy day. I cast out two strong demons. See y'all, y'all like, he starts deliverance in 2020. Uh, 2011. I was out there casting out demons still. So I've been doing this since the beginning of our ministry. It's not something I started with like online or anything. But anyways, that's here. Demons, right hate, and Cain. God protected me and his life got changed. It's sad how demons are so common, but everyone's so scared to talk about them because... Preach. It's sad how demons are so common, but everyone is scared to talk about them. That's true. They're uneducated. School is my ultimate test. It drains me. The devil is trying to creep in. He's nonstop, but so am I. And so is I was on my last semester of college and my uncle was like, you need to finish college. And I did not want to. I was like, I'm so drained by going to college and trying to be like full time preaching and all that. So that's what I, my frustration was like, oh, I don't want to finish college. And he's like, you're a month away. Just finish college. It's my God. The church is even taught. I did finish college, by the way. I got a degree in administration of justice. Talking about the Monday revival. It's a sad reality. I had a dream and I was preaching and I woke up listening to myself preach. So weird. Every day I get a fresh outpouring experience. I'm the burning one and I will not be contained. God's love is so deep and tangible and it blows my mind. I thank God every second for using me to change so many lives. It's so funny how the devil thinks he can stop me. My God is a God of light. Nothing can stop. It is also around this time, as we heard in the journal entry, that Isaiah begins to learn how to preach. So if you could see that back window, 
there's people outside looking through the window. It was, it was crazy. There's some footage on my channel as well, like the whole living room, the kitchen, the back living room, the hallways, the outside. But yeah, there's people outside looking through those windows. We were having like three to four to 500 mat, like at peaking of people showing up. And it, it was just crazy. It was an amazing time. If I could go back for like 10 minutes to that living room, I would pay any amount of money because it's just crazy what God did there. But who from? Now, I do want to say that we're going to take a little bit of time here to deep dive into his preaching style and why he preaches the way he does and who he claims taught him to preach. We're going to step back from sort of the timeline. I have a feeling that I have a feeling the cessationists are about to go crazy right here. Line of his story just for a minute, because I think this is incredibly important. Isaiah will eventually say that he's preached in 500 churches and preached thousands of messages. And if that's the case, understanding his preaching style is very important. People say, well, how'd you learn to preach? I never learned to preach for months. I would go to bed and I would wake up in my body at night, standing up, preaching full on sermons for months. This went on. My mom would say, Oh, I heard you preaching again last night. I would literally wake up into my body preaching for, I don't know, three or four months. I would never wake up in my bed. I would wake up either on my knees, on the corner of the room, on my back, on my side, because literally every night I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd be preaching full messages. And what God showed me was I was teaching you to preach. The Holy spirit was literally teaching me how to preach in the middle of the night. We also get a bit of an Every cessationist just fell out of their chair right now. Inside on how he teaches and why he teaches the way he does. I basically, my theory guys on teaching is if you have the New Testament and no one explained things to you, what would you come up with? So if you just read the New Testament, no one ever explained anything, you never heard a preacher, would you automatically come up with the courts of heaven? That's my teach. That's what I think about when I teach things. Like, is this something you'd get from the Bible if you didn't have anyone outside voices? And right there, I'm telling why I don't teach on the courts of heaven. So I hope people don't get confused there. I was basically saying, if you open up the Bible and just read it plainly, you wouldn't come up with, oh, I need to go to the courts of heaven and decree something. So I was actually teaching against the courts of heaven here. And then I also talk about how, like with deliverance, people say, oh, the gifts have ceased. There's no more miracles or like the deliverance doesn't happen anymore. I come, I always say, if you just had the Bible, you wouldn't come up with the gifts have ceased. If you just had the Bible, you wouldn't come up with there's no demons anymore. You would come up with, oh, we should probably still do this stuff. So that's the point I'm making here. I think people got this twisted. I wasn't advocating for the courts of heaven. I was saying you wouldn't come up with the courts of heaven teaching by just reading the Bible. Anyways, that's that's another video. Just telling you what a verse says or, you know, what would you get? When we're speaking as preachers or influencers or pastors, we're not speaking with the authority of scripture. Like we're not definitively saying this is what this means. And I don't know if you guys um, believe in like revelatory preaching. I'm sure you do. Like if someone says, don't be like Zacchaeus and spectate the move of God, right? Or don't be like Peter and deny God at work. Like speaking revelatory, like saying Leviathan wants to shipwreck your faith is like symbolic, not literal. So like, if you look at, for example, on um, first Timothy, this was, I believe a remnant radio interview where they're asking me about like preaching and we were talking about like revelatory preaching and stuff like that. The 119 says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear for some have deliberately, deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So like Paul is using the word shipwreck as an illustration for what happens when you deliberately violate your conscience. He's not literally saying, hey, your faith is a literal ship and it's going to wreck. So I think too, when we teach and preach like revelatory or like we're using symbolism or examples, it could also be misconstrued as you're saying this is exactly what the Bible says, which for me, my video of Jezebel or my video of Leviathan, I didn't say there's a verse that says Leviathan's a spirit or Jezebel's a spirit. I'm saying from what I draw from scripture, this is what I believe. This is my conclusion. And because I'm the one, you know, speaking it or sharing it, this is what I think. Just like anything we would preach. I mean, I don't think any of us get up and preach for an hour and preach word for word, literal text of scripture and say, this is definitively. And now I understand a number of us may not understand or I look like I'm 13 there. I've ever heard of revelatory preaching. So what I want to give to you is a minute and a half example from a very early sermon that Isaiah preached just a few years into the ministry. But I think that God... I literally look like I'm 12. This has to be 2012, 2013. Oh man, 12-year-old Isaiah. God is bringing back zeal. Remember when he turned the tables and he said, zeal from my father's house? The Bible says he... With a suit on? I remember this so clear. This is wild. He knocked over the dove chairs. They literally had in the temple... Oh, you got to hear this thing. I'm not preaching this, but I'm going to go into my message in a second. In the temple, they had doves in cages. Isaiah, please explain to me what that means. It means we've locked up the ghost. We've locked up the dove. What does a dove represent? You got to hear this. Nine feathers on the left side, nine gifts of the spirit. Nine feathers on the right side, nine fruits of the spirit. Five tail feathers.
Am I preaching about Carl this far back? The fivefold ministry. We have locked up the gifts. We have locked up the fruits. We have locked up the fivefold. But this is so startling. The Bible says Jesus came, flipped the tables, which is a picture of the tables are getting turned, and God's about to use nobodies now. He flips the tables, and the next verse, you won't believe what it says. It says the sick and the lost and the lame and the disease begin to flock the temple, and he began to heal them. I believe believe that when the Holy Ghost begins to move, when we unlock him from the box, when we let him out of his cage. I mean, we have definitely put the Holy Spirit in a cage. Am I, am I missing something? When we say, God, there's no time schedule. God, do what you want to do. I feel the Holy Ghost on this thing. Let the fire come like on Acts 2. I believe, I think this is what happened. They were sitting there sick in the city and all of a sudden they saw at the temple doves flying. Now, along with this, the journal entries become more sporadic, mainly because Isaiah is being asked to speak at a number of different conferences. Why are you hunchback like that? I think I was trying to catch my breath. My uncle used to always say, why do you bend over? And I'd be like, I can't, I can't catch my breath. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm breathing, but I don't know. Who knows? It was, it was, uh, it's what, 11 years ago. And this is where I need to step back to before we jump back into the timeline. One of the things that seems to be ignored in this entire process early Those are on, not bell bottoms, no. On in Isaiah's ministry is 1 Timothy 3, uh, verse 6 specifically. When Paul, writing to Timothy, says about elders, he must not be a recent convert or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, Isaiah, a new convert, is being asked to preach at a number of different conferences. We'll actually see that here in a very short amount of time, less than a year, I'm not li I'm not lying. I don't know how he came up with some of these old look at this 2013. Again, I have to commend him for finding all of this. A lot of these churches I was preaching at were not big massive churches and they didn't have YouTube or internet. Like most of the stuff you're not going to find online cuz this is again 13 years ago, 12 years ago. So the fact that he's finding some of these clips is like super crazy. It's it's cool. I mean, it's it's a walk down memory lane. And uh also the verse he's giving there is talking about elders. I wasn't an elder in a church, but that's another Story. year from his salvation he'll be asked to preach in front of millions of that's our first building 569 weeks ago again the fact that he's finding this stuff people. is commendable and so the question becomes is this the biblical thing to do now i want to be very clear. uh he actually got saved at the church i was going to when we were teenagers he started this thing in this house get really from there he wanted no accountability interns in my church were not allowed to go to the meetings he had i totally remember this guy and here's the thing I'm not going to say anything about him. We're just going to keep going. Okay. This isn't going to turn into anything. We're just going to keep on going. Uh, Dylan Walter, God bless you, brother. Clear that I can't find a ton of evidence of this, but there are places upon the internet and comment sections and articles that have been written saying that in the early days, Isaiah refused to be corrected. In fact, if it this is 100% false, this article got completely debunked. And I won't even tell you the person who wrote this article, what they're doing today. Again, I'm going to keep myself pure here. Um, but yeah, I had accountability from day one. I had not only my uncle who's a pastor over me, but I had multiple other pastors that were over me. I've been under pastoral leadership, two to three different pastors, my entire ministry. I've never once in my ministry not had accountability. And I promise you guys, I've been corrected and rebuked probably more than any other preacher you uh, know. It wasn't his way, it was the highway. And I think this is an indication of the thing that Paul was trying to prevent when he talks to Timothy. Now, to be transparent, his uncle does go with him on almost every single speaking engagement. Yeah, I didn't go on one engagement without my pastor uh, for a decade. And again, this article here is, you don't even want to know. It's just complete fake. Uh, I couldn't say any more. Without slandering the person that wrote this article, let's just say that uh, this is not a real article. Engagement, as far as I can tell. And in some of these videos, actually speaks before he gets up, saying this. So God is raising up a radical, unorthodox warrior. These are no-limit soldiers, and, uh, and, and they need fathers. The Bible says, Paul says you'll have many... By the way, if you don't know, this is Nino, my uncle, who I can't even say enough. I'll get emotional talking about it has been with me since day one, has literally given the last 13 years of his life to serve me, has never taken one dollar from the ministry ever, and has just, if you know Nino, let me know in the chat, because this guy is just incredible. I literally would not be, I don't believe I'd be serving God to this day without him. He's just selflessly laid down his life for me, and where I'm at now and what you see is a result of his obedience and his saying yes to God, and literally traveled with me my entire ministry, if I called him right now and said, I need a kidney, an arm, and a leg, he would give all three up within you know, five minutes. He'd say, where are we going to get this removed from me? So he's just 
I can't say it enough. I, I'll get emotional and cry when I talk about it. But yeah, this is Nino. This is my uncle. Many teachers, but few fathers and mothers. To and he used to get up before me everywhere I spoke and would speak uh, a couple minutes and like introduce me and then talk about the ministry and stuff. Raise up this next generation. This is the problem with the evangelists of, of past is that they had no fathers. And these move of gods died out really quick. But this next generation... So you can either believe my pastor and my uncle or you can believe the article from a person who... Um, is basically in the new age so let's just say that generation we have patriarchs and matriarchs that are fathering and mothering over us that have paved the way so we're able to do this thing right and responsible amen amen brother so can you guys help me welcome my nephew isaiah Saldivar? so it's something that we just need to consider as we look at the overall story of isaiah was it too early for him to preach even if he did have his uncle as his spiritual oversight that being said I say, uh, listen, if you're a young person listening to this and you just got saved, share your testimony and preach. I would never, ever tell somebody, you're too young to preach. You need to go through whatever, a Bible college, preach. You got the Holy Ghost, you got saved, go share your testimony, go on a street corner, go wherever you can, get on TikTok, start sharing your testimony, preach. God will bring someone to help disciple you and correct you and all that. Uh, no, I would never tell someone it's too early to preach. That's, uh, that's wild, that's wild. He's invited to a number of conferences to speak. March 28th. Wow, I can't even journal. There's too much to say. I spoke at a conference. It was an amazing weekend. I spoke to over 20 pastors in partition. We did two healing sessions. The first lady I prayed for got healed of heart failure. Her shoulder was out of place and her leg was literally popped out. As I prayed, I can feel it moving in my hand. It was truly I incredible. I was able to speak at the conference for 30 minutes and it came out perfect. The Holy Spirit never lets me down. I did an altar call of fire at the end. I got a prophetic word in front of the church went to the streets tonight and I scared a witch doctor and I prayed healing over a woman. See guys, when I say I'm soft now, the internet has made me soft. I'm not joking. Do you guys see how unfiltered I was? Now I'm like, oh, if I say this, what are they gonna think about me? They're gonna make another video. I'm way softer now, y'all. I need to stop. 2024, I don't care what people say, what they think, who makes videos. I'll keep paying their rent and giving them free content. Uh, I read these and I'm like, man, I got, I've gotten soft. I'm not gonna lie. The walker and she got healed. The spirits are pouring out and doors are opening faster than I could walk through. I need to quit my job. Too much wasted time. Lord, open a, a financial door, please. Thank you. I love you, Jesus. It's during this time that Isaiah obviously is experiencing quite a bit of success, traveling, the growth of the ministry at his home, but this doesn't come without some opposition. And he writes about this as well as talks about the one time he almost quit here. April 10th now, incredible stuff's happening. I went to minister in Sanger. I preached at a church going on 17th to bring revival to Patterson. I'm confident God will show up. I delivered somebody again. My demon counts about 60 continuing to be a soldier. I was keeping track of all the demons I was casting out, by the way. That's what the demon count means. Again, I've gotten soft. Let's just say that. And wage war with against Satan, no longer waiting for the attack. I actually have something I have to do tonight. So I'm going to try not to stop this too much and keep this stream going for three hours. But yeah, it's just I want to interject some stuff here. I'm declaring all out war and I'm going to be the first to attack Satan. Had a vision that there were tons of doors and as I chose one to go through more appeared. I seen a page writing but couldn't make out what it said. The cry of the hour is God I want more. I'm starving for a fresh encounter with the living God. The Bible's so clear when it says a prophet is not welcome in his hometown. So much opposition. My main focus is to be 100% led by the spirit of God. The presence of the spirit shifts people and churches go from survival to revival. I must journal more. God give me time. Putting all my trust in him and relying on his word, I feel myself maturing in Christ. Quickly, the spirit is upon me. Lord, help me stay out of the way so you can drive my life. Let me live out the calling on Jesus take the will. Hashtag Jesus take the will. My life, I need you. There was, this is going to sound kind of weird, but there was one moment when I had first gotten saved. Maybe I was saved like three or four months. Probably the only time in my faith where I was like going to throw in the towel was... I'd heard some of my best friends in the world that I grew up with were like making fun of me, talking bad That's about sad. me. Yeah, like I was just, <laughs> I felt like I had no friends. I was a loser, a loner. Because I was saved, I, I felt like I lost all my like real friends I was in the world. And so someone was like, yeah, you should hear. I was at this party. I don't remember who it was, but someone told me they're like, I was I at a party. I didn't this. Yeah, and they were like, I've shared this before, but I'm going to, you'll know, probably make sense in a second. And they're like, everyone was talking bad about you. Oh, you're this cult leader now and you're a christian and you like these are people i grew up with and knew for like years or yeah. best friends of mine so i was i felt like i was like i'm done with god god how could you like i have no friends and i i told god i'm like i need you to speak to me if you don't speak to me and don't do this guys this was my early days i'll save a few months but i was like if you don't speak to me i'm going back to the world i'm going to the party 
I'm this, I'm that. I was just like really mad at God, I guess. And I said, I'm going to open my Bible. And I did one of those. I'm going to open my Bible, yeah. speak to me, which I don't <laughs> recommend you guys doing that. Don't think about this. So I'm about, I, I wanted to quit. I wanted to be like, I'm done with God because all my friends are talking bad about me. I'm the laughing stock of the city. And I opened my Bible to this verse. Okay, so I'm only saved a few months. It's all fresh. I don't even know the Bible well. I haven't finished the Bible. This portion of scripture, I, I don't probably have never read at this point. First Peter 4.4, 4. look at this, okay? So remember the context. I'm about to quit. My friend's talking bad about me. First Peter 4.4, 4. I open my Bible. This is the first thing I read. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the wild flood of destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who stands to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. It was around this time that three major events happened for Isaiah in regards to his life and ministry. The first is that the girl that would eventually that's be my wife. Those are saying who's the girl you're talking to, that's my wife. Become his wife, Alyssa, visits the prayer meeting. My wife got saved like a month or two after me. She came, her friend said, oh, there's a bunch of these guys at this house, let's just go. And so they came, she thought I was crazy. And then she wanted to come back the next week. And so her friend was coming because her friend was like, oh, there's a bunch of hot guys at this house. That's why her friend was coming. But my wife ended up having an encounter with God. So she was like, you know, there's like a prayer meeting and all this stuff and we can go to it. And I kind of just blew her off because I'm like, why would I go to Manteca? I don't even know where that's at, like all this stuff. She's like, okay, I'll take you to the mall, but first we're gonna stop at this, this wow. house. <laughs> Her friend was trying to come find some good Christian guys that wouldn't cheat on her all the time. But anyways, God used it to for my wife's salvation. The whole point was there was a bunch of young people. Like it looked yeah, like a it party. Was, it did. It looked like a party. Yeah. There was people packed everywhere. And the videos are online. There's cars in the parking lot everywhere. And we're all young. We're all 19, 20. But it was a lot of young people. Yeah. We were all college age getting saved. She called it like a prayer meeting thing. She said, why would I want to go to Manteca? Yeah. So we were there. Were, there was a lot of attractive young people there because we were all yeah. partying and all that, right? We weren't like these. Just, and I'm just being real. We weren't like these nerdy, like no, no, you know no. what I mean, kids. It so, literally was like they partied last week. Yes, and, and then it was we're attractive. Like, it was yeah. attractive to like our age people because yeah. they're like, oh, you guys are. It's you like guys, something new. Yeah, they're like, you guys don't smell weird. You're not like normal Christians. <laughs> like you guys weird. are cool. Yeah. So I show up to the living room. To the living room, cars everywhere. And like people are outside. My wife said, I never heard the hot guy comment for the record. He made that up. We have confirmation that was not made up. My sister confirmed that was a true story that her friend said that. But anyways, that's, we already have that on the testimony video. We don't want to get into a debate here. I, people are just, it literally looked like a house party. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, whatever. When I walk in, there was just Bibles all over the floor. <laughs> they were saving their they seats. They were saving their seats. Yeah, yeah, because there's no like, room in the house. And I, I just remember being so confused because I'm like, what is happening? Like, from somebody not saved, it looked really... Yeah, it looked very cultish. We're it, in a house did. with Bibles all over the floor. It looked very... I'm like, okay, this is crazy. The second notable... I don't know if she tells this story, but somebody told her, her friend messed with her because people were, like, getting slain in the spirit. And her friend told her, like, oh, yeah, those people stay there all night and they, like, wake up in the morning. Her friend told her something wild. I don't know. I'm probably butchering it. She could tell you, but it's in her testimony. It's uh, really funny. And her testimony is on my channel. Event that occurs during this time is they come up with the name for the prayer meeting. They've been meeting for a while and they need a name for it. We oh, back <laughs> back in the day we started out. Is we it a secret? This is funny. No, it's not. Oh. Nobody knows, but it's funny. We didn't know anything about anything, and we named our ministry Generation Fellowship. Actually, I don't even think it had a name when I came. No, it didn't have a name, it but we ended up name. naming it Generation Fellowship, yeah. which is like the cheesiest Generation name. Generation Fellowship. It's so cringe. It's so funny. We have shirts from that still. Anyways, oh, I just have to laugh. Yeah. But we were like, it's old people with young people in this. It's so we're like a generation yeah. that fellowships. It <laughs> yeah. was so cringe, dude. That's the cringiest name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah. I'm 32 years old. We call it GF. <laughs> it was so cheesy. We had like these shirts that were like the absolute cheesiest shirts in the world. But it was amazing for the time. Yeah. And then we had this prayer meeting. And God's like, the name's the awakening. Yes. And all of this is taking place while Isaiah and his family are trying to find a larger area. Guys, this is my first time watching this. So, you know, I'm just, I'm rolling with it like you guys. I don't know. I don't know what's coming next. I'm kind of scared. I don't know. Area to hold the Awakening 209. There's even this video of his uncle Nino or Ben. During I, I, again, I don't know how or where he found these videos at, but this is old school. In an interview, I'll tell you the story about this in a minute. She's talking about expanding the Awakening 209 to an overflow center in a garage at the back of Isaiah's parents' property. It was a huge, a huge shop, actually. But I'll tell you guys the story in a minute. To know that we're here uh, in Manteca, uh, 13940 on Castle Road here in Manteca. And for the last 11 months, God has just been pouring out his spirit. Hey, got that little, you know, Windows Movie Maker edit down there. Upon this whole reason. 
and we have been getting people coming hours away from Fairfield, from Sacramento, from the Bay Area, all the way from uh, Pacifica. People have been coming from all over hearing about what God is doing here in Manteca. So this is what we're doing. God has been showing up. He's been showing off. There's been signs, wonders. So long story short, we had a huge barn on my property that was at my parents' house. It was probably... I don't know, big. It was, you know, four or five, 6,000 square feet, something like that. It was huge. So we were actually building it to be like a room for prayer and service. And we were going to move it from the living room to this big barn building. And we had it all done, sheetrocked. We had everything ready to go. And the last minute we were going to do it, use it, this huge building, the city came in and said, you need like $100,000 of permits and all this stuff. So we didn't end up doing it, but we were, we were doing it. We had it fully built. And it was a very sad moment because the last day the city said, you can't do it. And then a friend of mine who is a pastor who we've known forever was like, you could just use my building. We have a building here on the side and it seats like six or 700. And we ended up using that building. So that was the story went from the house to the other building. And this building didn't work out. Miracle and the best miracle ball has been salvation. So we're excited about that. We can't stop it. We were in the house. Now, as you see, we're here in this barn. We're converting it over because God is just opening up new avenues for us. And this is, this is only another step to where God has taken us. We know that God is doing great things. This is called the awakening. We're not a ministry. We're not a movement. This is a walk down memory lane, y'all. This is wild in a good way. Those things stop. We're not a past revival. It's what's happening now here in Manteca. So this is what we're doing. And God is just showing up. He's showing off. The third notable thing that happens at this time, and something that actually will change Isaiah's course of ministry forever, is somebody from Morning Star TV visits the revival. Shortly after that, you actually started to preach in, in other places. In fact, was it a month after your conversion that you were on the same stage with Rayhard Bonke and you had no idea who that person was? Yeah, so it wasn't a month. So the revival broke out of the house. I'm uh -huh. sharing my testimony that, I mean, people were literally hundreds outside listening through the window, looking through the windows. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, I have videos of this and pictures you can find mm -hmm. on my social media. I'd be preaching with people sitting on my feet. And then someone from Morningstar, which was Rick Joyner's ministry, found mm -hmm. out about it and mm -hmm. came down and did like a worship song. We have plenty of mods in the chat. So if they need to hit someone with a band hammer, feel free. At our house. This was probably seven or eight months, nine months, maybe in. Uh, okay. And went back and told Rick Joyner, there's this revival at this house I've never seen. She's like, I've been all over the world. I've been in crusades. I've never in my life seen anything like this. She mm -hmm. cried the whole time she was at her house. Wow. She told Rick Joyner, you need to get this guy. While Isaiah didn't know it at the time, this invitation from Rick Joyner to come preach at his conference is actually going to change his entire course of ministry. Yep. But there's a lot of things that happen in between being invited and actually going to speak. Now, in 2012, Isaiah's uncle files the Awakening 209 as a California nonprofit religious organization. If you look at the documents, it actually says it was formed in 1964, and that seems like a very odd date given that the Awakening started in 2011, just a year prior. But the reason it's filed like that is that it's actually a child. Yeah, everybody knows our, our church was a, obviously a nonprofit, just like every church. Organization. A child organization means that it's simply under another organization. And it seems like at this point in 2012, the Awakening joins a church network, specifically the Full Gospel Fellowship of uh, if you know how 501c3 works, uh, long story short, you need to have like an umbrella that you're under or start your own type of network. So we were under a church network for the 501c3, but that's a whole churches and ministries international legal stuff. The fellowship network for short. And they use this one cool fact too about our church was my uncle never took one dollar, which he could have on salary or money from the ministry. And I never took any salary or any money from the ministry as well. I fully was basically supporting myself from traveling, honorariums and love offerings because I traveled so much. So neither of us were ever on salary. Actually, no one at the church was on salary. All the finances that came into the church, we one, we had an orphanage. We, some of the money went there, but also we were using it to pay for the buildings. We rented a building for years, all the equipment, the building, everything like that. So all the money went right back in the ministry. We never took any money. I know I don't think it would have been wrong too. We just never took any money. And my uncle to this day, this is crazy. To this day, 13 years later, my uncle has never taken a dime from the ministry or been paid any dollars from any of the ministry, which I think he's worthy of getting paid, but he never did. He's like, I'm fine. I don't need the money. So me and him, well, he never took a dollar and I never took a salary or anything from the ministry. So just interesting. The organization, at least up until 2017, as a way to file their taxes and account for their income. I have no idea what happens after 2017, but up until then, we have some IRS documentation demonstrating their income and their expenses, as well as some travel expenses. Yeah, I don't know why he's going into this. I mean, I'm not mad that he is, but it's just kind of weird to add. It's like so random. We're talking about God and then it's like the IRS. And whatnot. 
We know this because the filing of the address is the exact same PO box that Isaiah uses all the way up till this day. There are two major things that happen in 2012 as well that will change his life. Yeah, I still have the same PO box. It's obviously a different account and everything like that, but the PO box is just where people send stuff if forever. This is a very, very important time in his life. You see, it was during this time that both Isaiah and his future- Yeah, some of the stuff, I'm like, I don't even know how he found some of this stuff, but I'm here for it. Wife were attending Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute. This is apparently where Isaiah pursues his doctorate of theology and a minor in business. Now, he- no, I didn't get a doctorate in theology. I got, I wish I did. I got a bachelor's in theology and they were having a minor in business. I don't think for the bachelor's you minor, I think a doctorate only, but yeah, I did four years and I have a doc, I have a doctorate. See, I have a bachelor's in theology. That's like actually accredited. He never actually talks about where he gets his degree in theology. He never has stated on any podcast that I can find where this is from. My wife's in the ministry for about a year. I, I've said it a few times um, when people have asked me and I posted it, a picture of my degree before on Instagram and a few other places. But the fact that he couldn't find this, hey, I'm kind of impressed because he's finding everything. So yeah, but I have posted it a few times. Here, mm -hmm. we go to Bible college together. So now I'm in Bible college, okay? So if you guys don't know, I have a bachelor's degree in theology. Yeah, and that wasn't my taxes. That was the church's taxes that we ran. But again, like I said, you could see there, no one's ever taken any, well, we've never taken anything from the church or any money, even though we could have, we didn't. We started Bible college, I did four years. I got a legit, bachelor's degree in theology not a certificate from like some charismatic school i got a legit theology degree went to bible college got trained in the word the only thing i was able to find was on an old website archive from one of his and if you guys don't know how he's finding a lot of this info is you can get website archives so say you delete a website you can go into an archive it's basically like a time machine and find old websites old information so a lot of the stuff he's finding he's pulling up from what's been off the internet or deleted or pages that are gone or whatever he's tracking back and finding old information and stuff which yeah interesting he's definitely deep diving for sure original sites in which it states that he was pursuing a doctrine in theology from this kingdom covenant leadership institute oh that's where he okay so that's where he got i'm getting a doctorate because i was after i got my bachelor's i was going for a doctorate but i didn't finish the program because i got too busy and i was like i don't need a doctorate but okay so that's where he got it but i don't have a doctorate i have a bachelor's now, the only Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute that I can find ever in existence. And yes, this is the KCLI. It's Dr. Pat Francis. She used to come to our church and she had a college that was accredited in the United States. She's based out of Canada. And we had a satellite school at our church, the church I was involved with, not the Awakening, but a church I was a part of. And we used to do every month, we did, I think it was 14 or 16 hours once a month. And we'd have to write like a I think it was 18 page, 15 to 18 page essay. And then every month it was like accelerated learning, intensive two days, I think 16 hours, something like that. It was basically two days, eight to 10 hours a day, once a month. And you get your, you know, you can basically travel, do all your stuff and then get your degree. So I did that for almost four years and got my bachelor's. So anyways, yeah. Existence, it was ran by a Dr. Pat Francis. And while it started in Canada, it seems like they also had a satellite campus that was set up in Savannah, Georgia around August of 2012. The school I don't know. I just know they have accredited in the U.S. and it's hard to get Bible accrediting. You have to have a legitimate theology school. And so we were a satellite school in Manteca from her her base where she got accredited. School is meant to be done via satellite. Uh, Isaiah talks about that in some of his videos. So I'm in Bible college now at our local church. We had like a satellite school. So mm -hmm. it was a big Bible college, but they would basically zoom into our church and we'd have a hundred students in the Bible by college. Zoom, I mean, literally and the zoom. satellite teaching would be done by teachers such as prophet Chuck Pierce, Peter Wagner, John Eckert, as well as Dr. Pat Francis herself the program. Yes, we have a exciting. Mm, I never got taught by Peter Wagner. I know. Oh, I'm trying to think of some of the professors. Miles Monroe was one of the professors. John Eckhart was a professor. Um, Barbara Yoder was a professor. I'm trying to think of all the names. Uh, Bill Hammond, I believe, was a professor. But yeah, I, I don't... Peter Wagner was never teaching any of my stuff. Staff of people, these are global leaders. They're global apostles and prophets and bishop, bishops that are, are teaching and training. And guys, please be kind in the chat. I don't know why you guys are being rude in the chat. I can't stand when I go into some channels and they're making videos about me and everyone's just vile in the chat. Let's not be like that. Let's not be like, we always talk about the heresy hunters, how vile they are. Let's not be vile like that. So I don't know what you guys are going on about in the chat, but uh, he made a documentary. So we're watching it and you guys don't need to be rude about it. It's just, 
This is all information online, but yeah, he definitely did dig deep, but yeah, it's all online information. All over the world, we have uh, Prophet Chuck Pierce, Dr. Peter Wagner. Uh, we have uh, just a, a huge lineup, John. So I guess Peter Wagner would teach there, but he didn't teach any of my courses because they had a doctorate, bachelor's, master's, all that. Eckhart, we have uh, Dr. Pat Francis, of course, and Dr. Pat, Pat Francis is the founder of these schools, uh, which she's in Canada. Given all the information we have from Isaiah's archive site, as well as what he said in various podcasts and what the Kingdom Covenant Leadership Institute promotional video promotes, this seems to be the college that Isaiah went to. Now, yeah, and this guy's also done, I think he did a uh, making a minister of Mike Todd and Stephen Furtick as well. So I'm not like the first and only guy he's done this on. As I mentioned before, something else happens to Isaiah during this time that also alters the course of his life. You see, Isaiah had had no interest in dating anyone he didn't- And if you guys are getting defensive, don't go read the comments on his video. Because the first like two, three hundred were basically that I'm manic, I'm demon possessed, I'm uh, pretty much the Antichrist. So yeah, go, le go leave a positive comment, but if you want to get yourself triggered, go read all the negative ones. I think he would maybe even ever get married, but while he was at college, something happens in a particular prophecy class. Mm -hmm. None of that. My wife's in the ministry for about a year. Mm -hmm. We go to Bible college together. So now I'm in Bible college mm -hmm. and the pastors, the speaker is talking about hearing the voice of God. And he says, I want everyone to go find an area in the room, lay down or get on your knees, basically humble yourself before God and don't get up until God speaks something to you. It could be a little impression. It could be, you know, a voice. It could be death. It could be God giving you a prayer. Pray for this person. Just get a word from God. Get something. It was a whole class on prophecy. Mm -hmm. I go and lay by the drum set in this big church and I'm on my face praying, Lord, what do you have to speak to me? And I thought Vlad, it was going to be, you're going to Africa. You're going to India. Here's this. And mm -hmm. I hear it. This I was about a year and a half. I want to say after getting saved. So a year and a half. Um, my wife was already in the ministry for, you know, a year and a half when this happened. Here is audible is, is audible, right? Like, uh, and I could be off by a month or two, but you know, I'm just trying to recollect back. It's all kind of smushed together at this point. To me, it was audible. It mm -hmm. wasn't audible. Like the night I got saved where yeah. I was hearing it from the outside, mm -hmm. but in my spirit, I heard audible voice. Alyssa is your wife. And she's in Bible college with me as well at the time. So from that moment on, I knew she, she said he was a little manic. I think manic, isn't it? Like you don't sleep, you have high energy for like a week. So yeah, I mean, by definition. But yeah, anyways, <laughs> I'm not my wife that. feelings did started have, stirring up. I'm trying did you to have go three hours here, by the way, but I keep pausing it to talk. Feelings for already, or you started to get feelings uh, after you I heard mean, about I that? Didn't, I didn't have feelings like that where I was like, I want to marry you. I mm -hmm. was definitely like, she's attractive, but it wasn't anything like feelings. It wasn't like, oh, I want to marry this girl or, oh, this is going to be my wife. And remember, I told God, if I get feelings, yeah. it has to be my wife, be wife, right? Yeah. So from that moment on, it was like a switch turned on. I went from being... I don't ever want to be with any girls. I don't even look at a girl. Don't even mm -hmm. talk to me if you're a female to this is going to be my wife. Um, we literally met with my pastor, told my pastor what I felt, talked to her parents, asked her dad if I could marry her at our revival service. There's 700 people there. No one knew anything. Again, we didn't date none of that. And I proposed to her and we got married two and a half months later. <laughs> Listen, this is the video of me proposing. Again, my guy went deep. He had a huge shovel. He dug. I, I don't even know where he found this. Alyssa, you're in the chat. Where is this video? I, mean, I think you have it somewhere, right? On maybe like Facebook. But again, this is my proposal video at the service. And the fact that he found this, I have to commend him. I don't know if he's like a CIA or FBI agent on the side, but he definitely did a good job at finding this stuff out. My wife said I'm dying and she's laughing here. But yeah, this is this is this is the real video. This is real stuff here. And I want to spend the rest of my life. Mind you, nobody knew we were like anything except some of our team, of course, but like we weren't like dating or any of that stuff. And uh, yeah, the whole church was like, what is happening? <laughs> There's probably 700 people that night. It was a big night. And that's Angie. Oh, I miss Angie. She's like, oh my. They have a very short engagement simply because Isaiah is going to be speaking a lot after. I think that's actually the first picture we ever had together, but it wasn't even like t we're together in the picture. It's just like somebody took it. After September. And so they decide to get married on September 15th of that same year.
Now, right after he returns from his honeymoon, Isaiah goes directly into speaking at a number of different conferences, specifically the one we spoke about earlier from Morning Star TV. And this is the conference that really opens the door for Isaiah in a number of different areas. Oh. So we fly out there. We get to it. It's a massive building, five story. It's like a hotel atrium. It was uh, mm-hmm. Jim Baker's old building, the old PTL building. And I'm in this massive building, huge auditorium, several thousand seats. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be on God TV, 40 million viewers total. And I'm like, I'm speaking Friday night, Reinhard Bonnke speaking Saturday. I'm saved like a year. Vlad, I didn't even know the names of all the 12 disciples yet by heart. I was like, (laughs) didn't know hardly anything. And I'm looking him up and I see 7 million in Africa, 5 million, 60 million plus saved. Uh, I'm I'm looking up Reinhard Bonnke. So I'm going to be speaking with him, but I didn't know who Reinhard Bonnke was. And I was looking him up. So I, I know it sounds kind of confusing, the wording here, and kind of jumping all over the place. I'm like, this guy is a legend. There's me and Reinhard Bonnke, which that was actually in San Francisco, which was another amazing time and super blessed to be able to preach with him. So when I met Reinhard Bonnke uh-huh. that night, that was the first time I ever had, like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have this, like, these guys are superstars. Uh-huh. I just knew, hey, God touched my life. And mm. so I told my uncle, I'm like, what should I do? Because I was thousands of people. It's five mm-hmm. stories. It was just overwhelming cameras. Here I am from a living room. I'm mm-hmm. like, dude, I'm, in, I'm preaching in a living room. What put am I nerve, doing here? Put, put it in nerve wracking. Put it in nerve It was nerve wracking. And this is why my uncle said, yeah, I'm not sure what happened in the audio in this clip for those. He said, Isaiah, I don't know. be yourself. And mm-hmm. they will recognize that God is with you, that God's presence is on you. Mm-hmm. And I got up there and I preached and I preached my heart out. I shared my testimony. I talked about being radical for God. No more of this Sunday morning only. We got to go all in. Halfway through the service, people were running to the altar, crying, repenting, turning uh-huh. to God. We didn't get out of that building, Vlad, until and out of that service, back to our hotel room till about two o'clock in the morning. We stood there and prayed for uh-huh. every single person. We saw miracles. We saw the power of God. And that 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 was one time where one guy told me that this will be your, for lack of a better term, coming out of the closet. And from uh-huh. that day on, yeah. Vlad, I kid you not, I was fully booked for the last 13 years from that one event. That one event was the 2012 Harvest Fest hosted by Morning Star Ministries. And Isaiah was right. Actually, I went to a youth conference first, then that event. But I I think the timelines got a little mixed up. Doesn't matter. Uh, I went to Morning Star like four or five times that year and a half. After that, he had booking after booking after booking. Along with this, Isaiah is trying to find a more permanent location for the Awakening 209. They had obviously outgrown his parents' house. They had apparently decided not to renovate the garage that was mentioned in the video earlier from his uncle. And they go to a number of different churches. I can't tell how many in total, but it looks like around... That was our second building we got, which was a friend of mine's extra building because he had a huge church he just built. So that was the one that we were... After the house, we went to this building. Round three, one of which was the church he proposed to his wife in. Eventually, they end up in the West Valley Pentecostal building. So, yeah, that's not the West Valley Pentecostal building. Maybe it is now, but it was Freedom Christian Center. So some Pentecostal denomination owned it, which is probably where he got the information. But yeah, the church there was Freedom Christian Center. That was our third building and our our final building. But it wasn't just the Awakening 209. While Isaiah was speaking at other churches, other Awakenings were happening as well. All of them called the Awakening, followed by the area code of the location in which the Awakening was happening. I don't even know where he got this footage. I need to get, I need to find out where all this footage is. Because I don't even, I mean, this is... I I don't even know where this, this is like memory lane here. So you had such awakenings as the Awakening 715 in Wisconsin, the Awakening 760 in San Diego County, Oceanside, and one of them- Oh wait, no, that was in, oh, see, see, I don't even remember some of these. Prolific awakenings, and one that Isaiah spoke at often, which was the Awakening 604 at Transformed Central Church. Okay, so the way these work was, these were not like our churches or something we started, People were like, hey, we see you had an awakening in your area code, 209. We want to have revival. We're going to host services for just praying for revival and preaching and seeing what God does. So they were hosting their services, naming them. We were like, it's not our name. They were naming it like Awakening 604, 207. Then I was going in some of them and speaking at them. But it wasn't like these were not my churches or I was just going and speaking at some of them. But it was like, hey, you want to have an awakening in your area code? Do it. And people were kind of naming their thing that. So that's kind of what that is. Canada. Now, of the videos we have available to us from 2013... And remember, guys, all the info he's getting, he's pulling off the internet, and a lot of stuff I did was not online because this was years and years and years ago, and most churches weren't even putting their videos on YouTube. Most churches didn't have YouTube. Most stuff didn't get recorded. I mean, I have audio files of so many places I preached at, but I was traveling. Like, let me just really, really quick... I'm going to go to a random month. So let's go to... Uh, 2017, let's go to October. I'll just show you how busy I am. I have every single date here on my calendar, still on my phone. 
I have every date for the last 13 years written on my phone here. But let's just go to, let's say, October 2017, randomly, just to give you an idea of how busy I was at this time. So October 7th, I'm in Arizona. October 14th, I'm in Florida. This is just random. I'm just picking random dates on my calendar. October 21st, I'm in Georgia. October 28th, I'm in Arizona again. So the entire month of October, on the weekend, I went from Arizona, Florida, Georgia to Arizona. That's just one month, and I was doing that like almost every month. I was gone, and I'll go to September here. Where am I? I'm in Southern California. I'm in Northern California. I'm in Wisconsin. I'm in every weekend. I mean, I have dates here. I'm in Modesto here. I'm in Arizona. So I go through my calendar. I have every date saved still. I was just every weekend somewhere at a church. I remember one church in LA. I did four different hotels and five different churches in five days. Four different hotels in five days and four different churches. And I was doing that. Sometimes I would preach at like five churches in a weekend. Sometimes I was preaching at like three churches, two churches. I was doing meetings every single night for like five, six days. I remember clearly doing like seven seven meetings one time in four days, like morning, night, morning, night, just preaching. I was 10 times busier traveling and preaching at that level than I am even now. Now I'm doing it online. But yeah, it was a really busy time. It was a blur. The decade from 2011 to 2020 was a complete blur. There are basically only two primary sources in which we can mine from. The first is the Awakening 604 at Transform Central Church in Canada, which has the most videos available. And secondly, the limited number of videos still available on Morningstar TV of Isaiah and his speaking there. Now, the only reason this is important is because it does give us an idea of how Isaiah preached back in 2013 and gives us a sort of a baseline to see if he's changed or morphed at all in his... I haven't. My sermons are the same. I'm still yelling, repent, turn from your sin, and go all in for God. Literally, the same sermons. Topics and how he speaks. Use us like the prophet Isaiah. Maybe I don't breathe as hard now. I mean... He said, whom shall I send? And he said, send me. Mattered. It didn't matter what you look like. Preaching in the short sleeve? What is this? What is this we've uncovered here? It didn't matter that you had mocos and tears. If you know what, what that means, heard. that's See, strange. when you begin to walk by a... This was in San Jose, Jubilee. ...motions and not by faith, you're going to give up your God-given inheritance. We can't walk by the fact... Two... This was World Revival Church in Kansas City. Three... Fire! 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 Again, the cessationists, <laughs> I know they're like, oh, this is demonic. I know they're cringing right now. now. 2013 is a very busy year for Isaiah. In fact, by the time we get to 2014, he decides to launch a website and a blog to let people know where he I would... don't even remember this stuff. Like, I, I remember these services, but like launching a website and blog. He's speaking and the latest Awakening 209 events. It's from this website that we can see sort of the early days of what Isaiah was going for in his ministry. For example, one of the first landing pages for this his site- This is my old website. How did he find this? I think he went through the time machine, but this is old school. This is the first website I ever had made. I actually looked really good too. It was called Isaiah Saldivar, Revival in the Eyes of a Newborn, where he had three specific goals, save the lost, revive the save, and equip the saints. And that's actually still my motto on my YouTube channel to this day. Save the loss. Revive now, the none of the, the blogs from the original site are available for whatever reason. There was no blog. That's why. They're not available because I never posted a blog. I just had a page called blog and I never posted one. It literally just said coming soon. And they're corrupted or they look like they've been hacked. I'm not sure which, but they're not there anymore. We do have some of the media page, which we've already shown, as well as some early signs that Isaiah was selling some digital sermon packs available to buy. I don't even know where I was selling these because I had the sermons I get free now with my monthly partnerships. I had those for sale on my old merch store in like 2017 or 18. I used to send people like literally with my merch, my t-shirts, I would send them a USB drive with all my sermons. And I, I did travel with those USB drives as well. Um, yeah, those, those definitely kept me going for a while. To support the ministry and what he was doing. Now, last thing, last thing before I start. We have product in the back. I'm going to go real quick this morning. We have product in the back. We have flash drives. Long story I'm short, so little. 20 messages for $30. If you don't know what that is, your grandkids do. Your kids. Yeah, I was selling flash drives. I used to have CDs. I mean, this is old school, y'all. 
And then someone's like, why don't you use flash drives? Like just sell the little flash drives, give 30, 30, $20. I think it was $30 for 20 messages or $20 for 30. I don't remember. I think it was $20, $20 for 30 messages on a USB flash drive, which the USB flash drives, they cost me like $10. So I think I was making like $10 a flash drive. I mean, I'll, I was getting by. Let's just say I was barely getting by, but uh, that must be, I don't remember that website with the buying the flash drives, but I did have them on my merch site later on. But yeah, it's just funny. It's zoo. Okay, you plug it into your computer and you get the files right there. It's small. Um, we have hip hop CDs. I know that sounds like a cuss word in the church. Those are my brother's CDs. But these guys that are, it's actually my brother. They're doing music and they're changing culture. That ministry being the Awakening 209, as well as speaking at different churches and conferences. And we see this continue into 2014. Isaiah continues to speak at the Awakening 209, as well as the Awakening 604, and is invited to a number of different churches to either speak at the church specifically or to speak at their conference. Just a few examples of these are the World Revival Church, the Focus Conference held at Rock Virginia Beach Church, as well as speaking at Harbor Light Church. To say his schedule was I don't even remember, like Harbor Light, I don't even, I'm sorry, Harbor Light Pastor, if you're watching this, I don't even remember this. I was, again, I was speaking so many different places. I, I have to look at my calendar. I should look through and just start writing all the churches down that I've written in my calendar, but... Yeah, I don't even remember. I'm trying to remember this. I'm the stage. I think this might have been in California. We did this big event where we got a bunch of churches together. I think that's what Harbor Light is. But we used the church and it was like of five other churches. So that's probably why I'm confused on the name. Deek but is yeah. an understatement. In fact, Isaiah explains it this way. Literally, my schedule was I would leave on Thursday or Friday, usually mm -hmm. Thursday. I would get home Monday afternoon from traveling. And then we go to a meeting. We'd go straight to a meeting. Mm -hmm. I was in the meeting. I would stay up. At least you guys could believe all the stuff I say is true because he's digging it all up. And you're like, oh, he really was preaching all these churches. Till three in the morning, getting a sermon ready. Tuesday, we had our service. Yeah. I would be gone all day. And you would day. leave at like two or something. Yeah, yeah, I would leave, I think, at noon. And then, uh, yeah, around to that. To do worship. Yeah, to go to the worship, mm -hmm. to go be at, open the church, pray. I would spend all day at the church praying, mm -hmm. getting ready for a sermon. Get home super late Tuesday, Wednesday pack, and Thursday leave yeah. again. That was like years, years of just grinding and traveling and preaching and being gone. And you came with me a lot in the beginning. And then when we had justice, you came with me yeah. some, but then it just got harder and yeah, harder. Now, it's around this time that some of the social media accounts for the Awakening 209 begin to change. For example, for some reason, the Twitter account continues to... We stopped using Twitter. I stopped using my Twitter. I think my Twitter is 2015. So, the, yeah, we didn't use Twitter. Post and repost up until about the mid-2015s. The Facebook page, I, I have no clue about because though. it is no longer available to the public. And the YouTube page seems to become more of Isaiah's personal YouTube page rather than the Awakening land. Yeah, I switched it. The Awakening had like... 300 subscribers and a bunch of old videos and I just I didn't want to make a new YouTube channel So I just changed the name to my name, but it's the same old page that the awakening staff That's why it says started in 2011 even though I didn't start really uploading till like 2019 something like Ending that page for their videos now into but he definitely went through I mean he's only missed a couple things he missed my when I was born he said 1988 to 1991 and then a couple other things he missed, but he's pretty, pretty spot on. I mean, everything's 2015, pretty spot Isaiah on. Isaiah keeps up his speaking regimen. He speaks at Without Walls Church in Arizona. It seems to be maybe- I used to speak there once a month for over two years and also at Fresh Start once a month. So I was in Arizona every month for a couple of years. One of the first time he speaks there, but he continues to go back to this church over the years. Then going into 2016, Isaiah- I miss that shirt. I like that shirt. Continues his speaking schedule, starting at a number of different churches, one of which being Fresh Start Church, a church in which he has a very interesting story about and a story that only happens because the awakening from Canada actually cancels coming to see him. As I was top golfing with a guy named Landon Shot, and he said, hey, there's a guy named David that wants you to come speak at his youth conference at a church called Fresh Start. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, I'm down. If you think they're legit, let's do it. And I was already preaching in Arizona a lot at the time. I was preaching every month in Arizona. So I go to do a youth conference. The night I was there, this was six years ago, revival broke out that night. And the pastor said, will you come back next week? Um, and I was like, I can't because there's a group from Canada coming. They ended up canceling. I went back next week and then it was full blown revival. And then I went back again and then I was going every single Now, along month. with Fresh Start Church, Isaiah speaks at a number of other churches as well. Yeah, I was the, the evangelist the night that Fresh Start Revival started. So I could put that on my resume and probably just retire. The Rock Church in Arizona. 
The Rock Church is in Virginia Beach, just to clarify. As well as the Awakening 604 in Canada. Though, at the end of 2016, the Awakening... All my Canadians, I used to speak in Canada all the time. Y'all missed it. Awakening 604 of Canada just sort of stops. But this doesn't mean Isaiah stops speaking in churches. In fact, going into 2017, he speaks at a number of different churches, including LifeSpring Community Church. Again, he's getting um information from videos on YouTube, but... I'll, I would say 80 plus percent of the churches I spoke at didn't have YouTube and didn't even post videos. So yeah, I w these were like the probably the bigger ones that were on YouTube or maybe posting videos. I spoke at so many little churches, medium sized churches, whatever. I was speaking everywhere for a decade. So a lot of them are just not, they just didn't have a video. Even to this day, I go to churches. I'm like, can I get the video file? They're like, oh, I don't know. I'm just like 2023. Every church should have the video file. You should have it ready to go. But that's that's just, you know, church in that's Georgia, right? As well as a number of times at Fresh Start Church. Now, into 2018, between speaking at the Awakening 209 and speaking at Fresh Start Church, I also spoke at the Awakening 209 every single week from the year 2011 to the year 2019, the end of 2019. So I spoke literally every week. We probably had two guest speakers a year for over a decade. He also preaches at the Awakening 715, which is an awakening that apparently up until 2018 is still going. These awakenings seem to be a revolving revival service each year now, with the awakenings meeting occasionally and Isaiah coming to speak at them at various times during the year. This is the same thing at the Without Walls Church. It's a yearly event in which Isaiah comes to do... He says the controversial stuff's coming, so we have uh, 30 minutes... 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah. So we'll see the contribution revival I'm curious and then leaves about. and comes back the next year. Now I do want to note with this sort of revolving door of revivals each year, there does seem to become a bit of weariness involved in them. Isaiah up to this point is very much a revivalist in regards to being invited to sort of revive the people at these different events. I did have the opportunity to speak to a worship leader at one of the previous mentioned churches. I oh no, a worship leader. I listen. I got on a lot of the worship leaders because I'm like, why are y'all so carnal? You guys go to the back while we're preaching. You guys. So, you know, I was kind of like, I would, I would make statements for worship leaders. So I'm curious what this worship leader has to say. It won't name it because it's not important. Oh, he's not going to name it. No, it's okay. I'm curious who this worship leader is. But it's one of the things that they said that really caught my eye. Now, one of the things they did say is that Isaiah is the same. Oh, at least that's nice. Let's see here. Off stage as he is on stage. There's no hypocrisy. There is consistency in what he says and how he lives. However, they did mention revival. This is something people meet me. They're like, you're really intense about everything. I'm like, yeah. Fatigue. And this is something that comes up a lot, especially with pastors like Isaiah. As when you invite them each year to your church for a specific revival, you kind of know what they're going to say because they've said it before. They go on in the message to say this. Yes, his message was focused primarily around repentance and revival, although in most services, I wasn't sure if I was even making the cut of a Christian because he was talking a lot about how Christians aren't even living godly lives, etc. He did spring godly enough. sprinkle in some healing and deliverance back then. It just got to the point to where I could predict the flow of the service. He'd get up on stage and preach about how sinful we all are. He'd open the altar. We'd play Let It Rain and set a fire for 45 minutes. He'd work his way through the crowd, praying and such, and eventually someone would close the service. I mean, yeah, we literally get up, preach, repent, turn from your sin. We're all, we're all falling short of the glory of God. I mean, it sounds like the gospel. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. None of us are worthy of his grace, but he gives it to us freely. We just got to believe by faith and turn to God and go all in. So, uh, yeah, I mean... I don't know if this is this is this supposed to be bad or good. I don't know. Now I don't think anybody has anything against revivalistic preaching. Rather, maybe it's more the way it's done. It's one of those things where if you're beat over the head over and over again, told you're not good enough, not doing enough, you're too lazy, you don't have faith, you can get to the. It's kind of like if the shoe fits, wear it. If you're doing what you should be doing, then amen. You say out your amen. If you're not, then it should convict you to go to that next level. Point to where revival burnout occurs. Jesus did not leave eternity, give up his divine privileges, be born of a virgin, come to the earth as a man, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, have a ministry for three and a half years, so that you one day, he didn't look and say, oh, in 2,000 years, one day in Stockton, they're going to come on Sunday and warm a chair, and for an hour, give me a little leftover worship and leftover praise, and then go the rest of the week living like the devil. Jesus did not think that when he died on that cross, when he was up there 
on that cross, he was thinking that there's going to be a person called the Holy Spirit that's going to dwell in believers and they're going to live a supernatural victorious life. And I'm going to put to shame every principality and every power on that cross. Jesus disarmed demons on the cross. The Bible says this, he disarmed and made a public shame out of the principalities and powers. These are high ranking demons that run governments and run cities and run countries. And we're all puppets in their game according to Ephesians 6 that we're wrestling against spirits, not flesh and blood. Every battle that we're facing is a spiritual battle. They're not natural battles. Does this guy ever stop and breathe? Like what's the... Like, I don't, is he breathing when he does that? I don't understand. And Jesus said, here's what I'm going to do. It is on that cross. I'm going to disarm and I'm going to take the power from the enemy. And now you no longer, now you, you might still, but that's a choice. You don't have to live subject to anxiety. You don't have to live subject to depression. You don't have to live subject to the status and all these Amen. demonic spirits. I've disarmed them and given you the keys. And so the only access the enemy has over you is the access you gave him. People are like, why do you go? I'm like, uh, that's just taking a deep breath in. <laughs> in fact, with some of the teaching and some of the preaching that Isaiah does, it seems to indicate that he believes that if you're not. And I know some people hate it. I'm not out of touch. If you don't like the breathing, don't watch my live preaching. Just watch my teaching videos. But yeah, I'm not I'm not like delusional thinking. Everybody loves that style. I totally know a lot of people don't love that style. That's totally cool. I ain't hard enough doing enough or believing enough then that anxiety or depression or other sin in your life is there because you allow it to be or because you don't desire to be free enough in fact he says as much when he talks about how many times somebody should be delivered how often would you recommend to go in for a session i mean i change my oil on my car every three thousand miles so it's no oh the cessationists are getting mad i'm sorry no problem getting the oil change every few months i would i would go through deliverance every couple months every six months it depends on how free you want to be i mean <laughs> if you're okay with if you're now listen if you're not having any symptoms right there's no no overwhelming desires no let's also remember deliverance is literally going and getting prayer so getting deliverance prayer i mean jesus said every day we pray deliver us from evil so there's nothing wrong with getting deliverance prayer. I stand by the statement. Go every few months. Go every two weeks. I don't care. Get deliverance prayer every chance you can. No perverted thoughts being created. No nightmares. No, and you're not having no symptoms. Then, hey, there's plenty of people we need to work on. Don't hit me up, right? Like, and you don't need to keep coming and coming and coming. But if there's symptoms and there's signs and there's things that are dragging you away, there's voices there, there's overwhelming desires, perverted. People are worried about the way someone speaks, but not mad the devil has their family for each thoughts then go for deliverance but again i don't want to create people that are deliverance junkies yeah. that are addicted to deliverance this leads some of his critics to say that he preaches a works-based salvation something he adamantly i've never heard that before he denies heading into 2019 the awakening 209 is still going it's still going in the same building the west valley pentecostal building that has been going in since 2014 However, in December of 2019, Isaiah claims that God came to him and told him, as well as his uncle, back in October of 2019, that they needed to go online with the revival. I've announced this on the internet, but I haven't gone into detail with any- This was December 2019 when I was saying this right here. This was four months, three months before the huge uh, thing where they shut everything down happened. Anybody about this? We're literally, now I'm not saying to do this, please. We're crazy, we're wild, and we're just different than most churches, okay? So don't listen to this and be like, well, every church should. No, it's just what God's called us to do. We are so believing this that God told me and told my uncle three months ago, we pastor our church in Manteca. He said, next year, I don't want you meeting in your building. The only time I want you meeting is for Monday night prayer. I'm talking about we have several hundred people that are showing up every week. I mean, we're packing out the building to the back, and the Lord says, I don't want you to meet. He said, I want you to go back to the, the, the street that the revival started in nine years ago and I want you across the street where my uncle lives we rent it we're renovating his entire house and the Lord said I want you to meet there and I want you to stream and broadcast a house revival movement because I'm getting ready to come in the home of every someone said honestly the dude who made this video seems respectful so far I thought he'd be more hateful or ugly good for him to, to this point I mean this yeah this is this seems unbiased to me I don't feel like this is like a heresy hunter video or a hit piece or anything like that I mean so far he's just you just showing everything that's happened and piecing it together. Now, also, guys, it's an hour and 23 minutes. So you can't expect someone to try to encapsulate 13 years in an hour and 23 minutes. So I'm not sitting here going like, he missed this. He missed this. What about this? That's just dumb to even think that someone can cover all that. It's just 
we're watching it for what it is and so far i mean i like it i like it it's, it's taking me down memory lane it's even making me emotional you know just seeing all this and i totally get it people aren't gonna like it people think i'm nuts and hate me what else is new does not bother me at all um there's always gonna be people that don't agree with what i'm saying what i'm teaching what i'm preaching and that's totally cool person in america i'm getting ready to invade people's living rooms he said isaiah the days of them coming to hear you preach and flying across the country are over isaiah takes this seriously and actually starts broadcasting worship services from his uncle's living room encouraging other believers to get together with their families and friends every tuesday night and do the same and it's important to note the reason why he's doing this is because he believes that the lord spoke to him to stop meeting with the awakening and start at-home revivals across the entire country. Now, the only evidence of them attempting to do this is from an Instagram post in March of 2020 before everything shut down. Uh, there's nothing really online that I can... We actually had everything set up, the whole room ready to go, fully remodeled to do this living room thing. And then when the whole shutdown happened, we started online before the shutdown, which thank God God prepared us. I have a whole story about that. And uh, the online took off so crazy that we had now too many people basically wanting to show up and we couldn't figure out a way to do it still with everything going on with the amount of people that we had and we couldn't turn people away and tell them they couldn't come so it basically was just a difficult situation of how could we do this with thousands of people now we didn't realize the online was going to blow up the way it did and so that's partially why this and then of course with the whole thing that happened where you know they were like we're going to arrest you if you get together find anywhere about them attempting to do it my wife said don't worry i won't go look at the comments Alyssa, you are banned chat let her know she is banned from reading any comments okay my wife cannot handle the negative comments i'm just gonna say right now to not no fault to her but she cannot handle the negative comments Alyssa, you're gonna be grounded if you go read the comments on this video okay you're banned don't not do not go read the comments i i don't mind i can read 500 comments of people saying this goes demon possessed i don't even care i'm like oh, pray for me then who cares um it doesn't affect me i don't lose an ounce of sleep but Alyssa, don't do it don't do it, Alyssa. I'm telling you right now. After that. Instead, it seems like Isaiah continues what he had started in January of 2020, which is doing... No, I don't ground my wife. Unfortunately, it's illegal. Online streaming, either with guests or... I'm giving... Anyways. Or by himself. Why did you stop pastoring your church? Because God told me to shift all of my focus and attention in 2019 at the end to live streaming. I thought it was crazy. Everyone thought I was crazy. I, I do have to say this guy's had to have watched all of my content because a lot of these clips he's pulling are from two hours into my streams where I'm at the end talking to the chat. So he's definitely done a lot of time and research. And that's why I keep saying I commend him for this because I know it took an extreme amount of time for him to do it. And I'm not here to question anyone's motives or say why he did it. I don't really... I have no intentions of saying anything. I don't know his motives, but yeah, it definitely took a lot of time. So I have to keep continuing to say, I commend him for, for, uh, all the time he put in. I thought I was crazy. And then in January, 2020, I launched online and went full time with online. And this is exactly what Isaiah does at the beginning of 2020. Isaiah starts his first endeavors into live streaming and podcasting. Episode one, it was so bad. I was like, welcome to the Revival Lifestyle Podcast. Thanks for being here. My mic was like in the wrong spot. Everything was wrong. But hey, we all have to start somewhere, baby steps. With a podcast called Revival Lifestyle. The first episode airing on January 8th of 2020. Now, at first, it's just him and his brother and maybe a few other guests talking about revival and talking about Christianity. Eventually, he does get guests on like Alexander Pagani, which he eventually becomes friends with. Also, we can see actually me and Pagani knew each other years before we went online together. Um, screenshot yeah. that the Demon Slayers apparently started as the Demon Busters, but then upgraded. No, we didn't start as the Demon Busters. The Demon Slayer was literally a group chat of us guys, and uh, we never started like a group or anything. Even to this day, there's no Demon Slayer group that we started. It was a group chat with four of us guys who are like brothers. But yeah, that's not we weren't the Demon Busters. Their name. Not sure which is better, but just interesting side fact as well as vlad savchuk which he and also to be clear the guy making this i'm pretty sure he's cessationist he's done a couple sermon reviews on me which he was you know i didn't watch them all but i, I skimmed through them and they're very critical of me so but i think he, i think the documentary in whole is unbiased but just to give you a picture of you know where he's at but i think i think the, the the documentary seems unbiased it's hard to say because there's a lot of information. Also eventually becomes friends with. However, Isaiah starts Friday Night Fire. Around also, I'm watching this for the first time with you guys. So maybe my thoughts aren't collected enough and I might be saying stuff that 
out of line a little bit because it's my first time. I'm giving you guys my genuine first reaction to this. Around April 11th of 2020, each live stream starting at 6 p.m. And this seems to be his first live stream by himself in which he preaches and takes questions at the end. I'm grateful for the deliverance, even in my own life. Some people say, Isaiah, why are you so into healing? It's because I've been healed. Why are you so into prayer? It's because prayer has changed my life. Why are you so into deliverance? It's because I'm deliverance is number one. This format is to be the beginning of what- Why can't we all be demon slayers? You can. I mean, like I said, it was just a group chat. Seems to gain his channel some traction. Most videos haven't broken three or 4,000, and this stream occasionally has up to 8,000, but continues to go up as the channel grows. His first viral video seems to be a video entitled Ex Satanist. This was when I used to upload my uh, podcasts onto YouTube as videos. So they weren't live and they do a lot better that way, but I like going live. So I don't do this anymore. But yeah, I uploaded a podcast from Facebook onto YouTube. And High yeah. Priest John Ramirez must see, which ranks up at the recording of this video at 1.4 million views. And by the end of 2020, Isaiah has already ranked up 10,000 subscribers on YouTube a number that we'll see quickly grows. But in addition to this, he redoes his entire website, adding the tab deliverance to it. Now it's not as if Isaiah had- He is, man, he's good. He's good, he, there, I don't know. I don't know, his, his name's Honest Youth Pastor, but he might be Honest Youth Pastor slash legit CIA agent. I don't know, because he's Talked he's about good deliverance up stuff. until this point. Obviously he had preached about it, his ministry started with deliverance, but this is when he begins to add the tab to his site, and it becomes more prominent. In fact, by the end of 2020, Isaiah already has a deliverance map on his site. There's only 100 people that have applied for this deliverance map, but 120 plus applications, he says, that they're still- Yeah, this was like right when we launched it. We had 100 people instantly apply. That's what that post was. Reviewing. And that's basically a map where believers who do deliverance can go, they sign up, and now they're on a map, and those that need deliverance can reach out to their other brothers and sisters in their area and get delivered, baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, whatever it could be. Because the problem was people were saying, the deliverance map spawned our house church. That's amazing. I love the testimonies that come in. <laughs> you preach on casting out devils, but there's no churches around me that will do it or pray for me. And guys, another reason why I could care less about all the criticism I get about deliverance is because seeing people get free is to me way better than worrying about criticism so like i could either not be criticized and not see anyone get set free or i can see people get set free and be criticized i'll take seeing people set free and criticized that's why the criticism really just doesn't bother me from from whoever so we made this map can i contact you for it. personal deliverance i don't offer personal one-on-one -on -one deliverances um because i have too many people that want deliverance from me that's why i've made a deliverance map because i'm one person i can't deliver everybody and i think yes the map is still up it's updated every single day we have almost 3,000 people on there people get a facetime an application it's all there on my website still it's a negative thing when we try to do it all like i'm the guy that's going to deliver you i'm the guy i want to empower the body of christ to do it and the idea behind this deliverance map is to mark people on the map that will also perform deliverance ministries, like Isaiah, since he can't get there to do deliverance on everyone. Now, to be added to the deliverance map, you have to fill out an online application in order to be added to the map. And as Isaiah has noted in some of his posts, there is a vetting process that occurs during it. However, I don't know how deep the vetting process is. I only say this because when you click on some of the churches on the deliverance map, some of the things that they say within their description are a bit concerning and I would have thought would have been caught in a vetting process. All this to say is that Isaiah does have a disclaimer at the top of his deliverance map that he isn't responsible for any of the interactions you have with the people that are connected to the map. And I'm sure this is for legal reasons. All it's not for legal reasons. It's just because I don't know every single one of these people. So people are like, well, I'm worried. Then don't use the map. I mean, to me, it's like, I remember when I first needed deliverance, I so badly needed anybody to pray for me. I would have been, I would have used the map back then. So yeah, the, it's not legal. I guess it could be for legal reasons, but it's like, hey, I don't know all these people personally. It would be impossible for me to know all these all people personally. All this to personally. say that deliverance but people are getting added and removed every single day. So people are also getting removed. If we see something sketchy, if somebody reports, trust me, there's somebody doing this it's a lot of work to do this. Takes more of a front facing position in Isaiah's ministry now that he is online. I was set for using your deliverance map 13 years ago. Um, Line. That's amazing. I didn't have the map 13 years ago, but maybe you mean at one of our services. And talking about it more.
This isn't to say that he doesn't do deliverance. Obviously, he does do deliverance at the churches that he speaks at. But there are some online deliverances he does as well. He has a small playlist of Zoom deliverances on his channel, with the latest video being from July of 2020. Spirit is there. I commend any spirit. Yeah, for those asking, we make negative money on the deliverance map. It's not monetized, so we don't make any money off of it. We lose money because I spend money to pay somebody to run everything that I trust in my ministry and I pay for the website hosting, which is expensive. Uh, the map hosting, I should say it's a custom map and whatever. I'm not gonna get into nerd talk, but yeah, we don't make money off it for those asking. You're there to come up right now and manifest. I can, for those that think I make money on deliverance, just let me just say I lose money doing deliverance. Cause, uh, put it this way. I wouldn't have hardly any haters if it wasn't for deliverance. So no, I've never made any money on deliverance or doing deliverance. Man, any stubborn demon come up right now and reveal yourself. Come up and reveal yourself. You hiding spirit. Come up. Reveal yourself in Jesus name. You have no power. I command you to come up and reveal yourself. Now. What is your name? I'm angry. Anger. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> Anger. Let's go. You have no power. We know you're there. We're not playing with you. We're not gonna give up till she's free. So don't waste your time. Let's go. Spirit of anger, come out right now. <laughs> Who's the Shriners? I don't know who that is. Leave him now in Jesus name. Go, every spirit go now. Every spirit go now. Be loosed now. Come out of him now in Jesus name. We just say be loosed in Jesus name. Be loosed in Jesus name. Be loosed in Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. Come out, come out, come out. Every foul spirit, come out now. Now, Isaiah seems to realize that people are coming to him specifically for deliverance and tries to deflect that to other people as much as possible. This seems to be why he stopped the Zoom deliverance calls. Now, he leans into the reasoning behind why he leaned into deliverance calls on a recent podcast with Remnant Radio revivalist at heart um it was only until august 2020 i started really preaching about deliverance i think anybody that's online or in the church it's safe to say deliverance was talked about more in 2021 than ever before at least every pastor i've been connected with um has been talking about it has been asking about it has been even pastors that don't agree with it have never really talked about it much are now disagreeing with it in 2021 so there has been a mainstream when it comes to deliverance this interview was a year ago, two years ago, I think. At least like what I've seen, like like never before. You know, let me just give you an example. Um, we added a thousand people in 2021 to our deliverance map. Now, all of the content that Isaiah is putting out pays off in 2020 as well as 2021. He already had 10,000 subs on YouTube by the end of 2020. And when we go into 2021, now I'm just going to say putting this clip in is a little bit sus to me because I deleted this podcast with Catherine Crick. I'm sure he already knows that. So um, yeah, in the reformed and cessationist community, they hate Catherine Crick. And I don't say that as a joke. I literally mean they hate her. So to throw this clip in feels a little weird because this clip isn't even online anymore. I, I've deleted off my episodes with her. I talked about that already. Why? I have concerns with her covering and a few other things. And so I deleted our episodes. But yeah, it feels a little bit weird that he would throw this clip in with Catherine Crick. By February, he has 15. And I, I just can't stand when people associate I with people that I'm not even connected to. I've done two episodes with Catherine Crick. I've talked to her two times total. And then when people connect me, like we're like ministry partners, we're doing stuff together all the time. Um, and I'm not spreading hate to her. I'm just saying I have uh, concerns with her leadership and her covering. So that's why I removed the episodes together because I can't support the people that she's covered by and some other couple other things. But anyways... Yeah, it's weird when they lump us together like that. 57,000 subs. And, and I'm not throwing shade at Catherine at all. I'm just telling you guys personally why uh, my leadership and my covering thought it would be best to remove the videos. And I also have leadership and covering myself that I listen to. So I don't make just the decisions. And hits 100,000 subs on Facebook. This continual growth is due to a couple of different factors. One, he is putting a lot of content out, like we mentioned at the beginning of this video, content that not a lot of people are talking about. And as he mentioned in the previous clip, deliverance. I am putting a lot of content out. I uploaded 700 days in a row. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna be going over my stats here soon, but at this year we're at, how many uploads? I don't know, almost a thousand uploads this year, several hundred hours of streaming. Uh, I think we're at over 250 million views. I have to finalize all the numbers, but it's it's crazy. This ministry is talked about a lot. So he's sort of riding that wave. 
Now there's two things that he appears on that I think really do give him a bump in 2021. The first is that he appears on something more with Bob Duvall. ...to actually use the gift. Let me just give you a testimony from a few weeks ago. I was preaching at a church out in North Carolina, and I'm on the, on the stage on the altar, and I said, okay... This actually did, a, this actually went pretty viral. I think it got like a million views, two million views. So yeah, this did give me a little bit of a bump on YouTube. Lord, I'm by faith, I wanna activate this gift. I wanna see in the spirit, I wanna activate. And all of a sudden, Bob, I'm walking around looking at people at the altar, oh, just available for what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And all of a sudden I see a young man kneeling down at the altar like this with his head down, and I see a dark figure over him, like a dark cloud. I knew it was- Me in a suit, that's a rare sight. It's a demon, but it didn't look like you think. So, were, okay, were you seeing it, seeing it? I was, or, I was like seeing- Like in the natural, were you I was seeing something? Seeing, so it was, it was superimposing itself over over the natural. So it was almost like the natural realm and then something over the natural realm. So I knew it was in the spirit, but I knew it was something demonic because it was like a dark cloud. I don't want to say it was like a demon. This is my me trying to talk slow. They're like, hey, for the interview, don't talk too fast. And uh, I was struggling here to talk slow. With claws like and you. And I'm still talking fast. I think right. it was a darkness over him, like a dark figure, a dark cloud. So I knew there was a demon. I discerned with the discerning of spirits, saw it in the spirit, discerned it was a demonic spirit over this young man's life. And in case you're wondering, this is not the only time that Isaiah says things like this. There's been other times as well where he describes how he sees demons and what they look like. Can you look into a crowd and see demons on people or over areas? Yes. That's one of the reasons why I don't wear glasses when I preach is because oftentimes... Apparently, Apostle Pagani's in the house. I don't see it in the comments yet, but shout out to you, brother. And again, guys, those asking the black border is on his video, not mine. Just to answer your guys' question about that. Sometimes I can see demons on people and I start getting downloaded for them when I look at them. Around this exact same time, he appears on Supernatural with Sid Roth. Want to get saved, these high... This was filmed the same time as something more. I went to the studio and filmed multiple shows at the same time. High-level witches and warlocks. I was dealing with a girl yesterday that's in big, t taught yoga for years. Where are they going to go? So we have to be this ready as believers, slow. not just the churches, but all of you watching. We need to be trained and equipped and ready to deal with these demons of these people that are coming out of the occult, that are coming out of Hollywood, that are coming out of New Age, that want deliverance. And our Messiah was the one that introduced deliverance. Both of these appearances happen and have a combined viewership of one 1.2 million views that does attribute to some of the growth on YouTube. If you check his stats during this time, they dramatically jump. Just yeah, that. So the way this growth on YouTube works when you see massive jumps is usually because you have a, a short go viral, like viral, like two, three, four million. Um, the Sid Roth, when you're on a show like that, his audience is older. I think that didn't do that good on YouTube. Uh, the something more did, but you it doesn't. It's not a huge turnover. You don't get a lot of subs from doing these shows and going on TV or anything like that. It's a it's a small amount of um, subs that you'll get or growth you'll see. These big climbs are from shorts randomly going viral or podcast episodes. Like in the last month, we've had two episodes go viral, and that's like four or five hundred thousand views on a full long form video. So that's when you'll see a spike. But yeah, I could go into the nerd talk of why things spike, why they don't. But a lot of it has to do with just shorts videos or long form videos going viral but when you're on someone's show you don't really see a lot of growth just looking at the data available to the public online he's roughly gaining 14,000 subscribers per month just on youtube and after these interviews in july his rate increases even more just and actually part of that is from i started doing uh green screen shorts and youtube shorts focusing on i didn't focus on it before that's why you're going to see big spikes is from the youtube shorts jumping between 14,000 a month to 40,000 a month between june and july of 2021 this speaks nothing of the fact that he had already hit 100,000 subscribers back in April of this same year. These are just additional subscribers from all of the viewership on YouTube, as well as Sid Roth's programs. Someone said, I just can't believe how detailed this is. It's just crazy. I mean, again, he went deep. Now, around this same time, Isaiah does something that is reminiscent of what he did back in 2014. After going on Sid Roth's network, he decides to do a commercial spot for Sid Roth. This is definitely not, listen, the way he threw that little jab, this is reminiscent of what he did in 2014. I think he means selling the flash drives. This right here is for Sid Roth's show. If you guys don't know, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I'll just say it. I don't really care. When you go on shows like this that are expensive for television, let's just say this, okay? If you're watching television, you're not paying to watch a show. The person providing the television show is paying a lot of money, like several hundred thousand dollars often for one airtime or one episode, depending on how many channels, all that nerd stuff. 
So they're selling books or audio teaching CDs because again, they have an older audience to pay for and support the ministry to fund the airtime because you're not paying for the airtime. So that's kind of the way a lot of these work. You sell a product to pay for the airtime. And I'm not against selling products. I personally don't sell products like this, but this was for his show, um, which is what he's showing. So this was definitely not like what I was doing selling my flash drives. I did that for years and that's no secret. With exclusive teachings about demon and demon possession and casting demons out of individuals. But yeah, when I went on the show, they said, hey, can you film us an audio four part series so we can sell to raise support for our show? And that's the way it works. And I was like, yeah, no problem. Of course, again, it's exclusive for our it's super. Now this, I would never edit a video like this. I think that this video editing and this um, commercial, and again, they might get mad that I say this. And I'm not trying to be rude. I think it's cringe. It's definitely old school. I, uh, I would never post a commercial or video like this, but yeah, I get why people are like, this is cringe. Why would you sell this? It's, I'm not a fan of the way they put this together, but I don't have a problem with people selling teachings, selling books, any of that. The irony is. I had a, uh, let me just say this. I'm going to be, help me, Lord. I don't want to be rude or anything, but I had a lot of John MacArthur followers, reform cessationist people attacking me about this. Yet John MacArthur sells a Bible with his name on it called the John MacArthur Bible and uh, brings in $75 million a year. Just saying. So there's a lot of double standard here. You guys are mad that I made this, even though this is Sid Roth show, yet John MacArthur can sell a study Bible, bring in $75 million a year and that's fine. Again, there's a lot of hypocrisy with these, uh, in these call out worlds. And I'm not saying he's calling me out or nothing like that. I'm just saying the hypocrisy is pretty intense. Natural audience, yours for a donation of- But yeah, I cringe at these commercials. I'm like, ugh, feels weird. $29 shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 3687. You will walk in the divine power of God. You'll walk in the supernatural and it will become normal for you to see demons cast. It should be. Should be normal. It was, it was in the New Testament. Now, it will become normal for you to see the sick healed. I can't wait for all the reaction videos of the reaction video of me reacting to this documentary. So they're going to do a reaction to me reacting to reacting to a documentary. It's going to be a reaction inception uh, coming probably the next two to three days from all the channels you guys can think of. It'll become normal for you to see someone die and say, I'm going to go pray and believe God to raise them for the dead. This is the first time, as far as I can tell, that Isaiah has sold anything since he started selling the sermon packs for 20. Yeah, and I'm not selling it, said Roth. So just to be clear, I'm not selling it. Dollars back in 2014. Now, at the end of the same year, Isaiah partners with Jeremiah Johnson and his organization, The Altar Global, to sell an e-course on spiritual warfare. Again, guys, just remember, I've already gotten into a controversy with this and got frustrated by someone making videos saying, look what Isaiah is selling. Number one, I'm not against selling e-courses. I don't but I'm not against it. But I want to remind you, just do the simple math in your head. Who was selling the last e-course? Sid Roth. Who's selling this e-course? Jeremiah Johnson. I'm going to put up a finger, okay? I'm going to do this one time and one time only. I'm going to put up a finger of how much money I make whenever you buy Jeremiah Johnson's Spiritual Warfare e-course by Isaiah Saldivar. Are you guys ready? I want everyone to look at the screen. I'm going to show you how much money I make every time someone buys one of these e-courses. Here we go. Here comes the finger of how much I make. You heard it here first. And that's not an Illuminati zero. That's how much money I get every time a Jeremiah Johnson spiritual warfare e-course is sold. Okay. So when I went out and preached at his church and filmed an e-course, he paid me an honorarium, which is what every pastor does when someone goes and preaches, if you didn't know. But this e-course is his e-course. He asked me to come film an e-course for him. That's how much I make. From the camel's mouth, is that the saying? That's how much I make. Just to be clear, because I know people online have lied and said, Isaiah makes money from this e-course. I'm not even mad about it. If I did make money, I would tell you guys, but that's how much I make, zero dollars. The course isn't available. And, and I've made zero dollars since that came out from this e-course. Available anyway. Again, when I went and preached from his church, he gives me a love offering or an honorarium, whatever. Longer, but the internet archive showed that it sold for $39.99 at the time, and the course covered a lot of the same things that the course for Sid Roth seems to cover. Things like why deliverance is for everyone. And I didn't ask, and he's not supposed to be giving money. I'm just setting the record straight for those online that are like, I was just making all this money off of Jeremiah Johnson's spiritual warfare E4. Unfortunately, I have to say stuff like this because people are just, I'll go on and on and on and they'll milk it for like months like some people have, not to mention any names because they're probably in the chat or watching this. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to be clear. I make that much money on that. One, ways to ensure success and deliverance. 10 practical ways to cast out demons. Nine reasons those demons may not leave. And uh, spoiler alert, you can find every one of these topics and videos on my YouTube channel for free. So they're cats out of the bag.
and how to shut the gates. But these were filmed in studio at his studio. So, but I am saying you can find all this info Hell, as well. And it also comes with a website. free delivery I mean, that Isaiah will YouTube. pray over you. It's unclear how much Isaiah gets paid or is getting paid at all for these. And while zero. While this is not incredibly important, it is interesting to know that Isaiah's ministry is not a nonprofit. He said before that he is not a 501c3. Yeah, I'm yeah because I'm not a church. But anyways, that's I don't want to get into tax info and all that. Are you a 5013C? No, I'm not. It says on my website when you go to give, I am not a 501C3 in all caps. So it's definitely not a secret. So there's no way to know how much he's getting for these courses or how much he's making in general. And not that that's important, but that is a totally different approach than we've had in the past. With the Awakening, it was a nonprofit organization. And most ministries aren't non And you can see there, uh, 194,000 in revenues, 157,000 expenses. I didn't do any of this, but I could tell you right now, me and my uncle, neither of us took a salary and got any finances from our church and we were sending 20 to twenty five thousand dollars i was raising for our orphanage we had an orphanage in the philippines for three years which i should probably do a video on but anyways i was raising out of my own ministry raising 20 to twenty five thousand dollars sometimes to send to the orphanage and making zero and from the church making zero but anyways profit that's organizations here and over there. as well but clearly now that's not the case now, along with these infomercials and e-courses 2021 also brings some very interesting backlash I like how that sums up the year. Along with these e-courses and uh, uh, infomercials, sums up the year. For Isaiah as well. He's been going hard since 2020. Yeah, I'll tell the story about our orphanage at some point. I should probably do a video on that. I mean, yeah, I should probably put a... I don't know why I've never made a video on that. On deliverance. And the subject of Christians and demon possession continually comes up and causes quite a bit of issue for Isaiah. A lot of online critics criticize his... Doesn't cause any issues except for from cessationists who don't believe in it. So, yeah. The only criticism I get is from the Reformed camp. His use of the term possession or even the idea that Christians can be demonized if they're not possessed. Isaiah tries to make a video of this going through the details of this and is even hosted by Ruslan on his podcast early on to try Ruslan, to work through hey, what he, he made the documentary. The way you described it was a Christian can deal with demonization, yeah. but the spirit of a Christian is yeah. filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So you can yeah. have demonization. Uh, our orphanage was in Mabalakat, Pampanga in the Philippines. Mabalakat, Pampanga was Pampanga is a state. So that's where our orphanage was. And I was in, I went to the Philippines uh, several times. On your flesh, you could have demonization attached to your soul or maybe your emotions. I don't know if that's a fair interchangeable yeah. way of that. But the spirit of the Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Ghost dwells in us, we cannot have a demon in our spirit, but we can yeah. have demonization or deal with. Yes, and I still teach that and believe that to this day. 100%. He's saying it there. Demonic um, tension. Dem, dem, I, I don't, I, I don't want to use the word oppression because I feel like that's a cop out, right? But we can yeah. deal with demonization. Do, do you want to elaborate on this? Is what they say. They say Christians could be oppressed, but not possessed. But here's what I want to say. There's no difference in the Bible. There's right. no difference in the New Testament when it comes to demons. Jesus never distinguishes and neither should we. So I teach people this: stop saying possess, remove it out of your vocabulary and oppressed um, because this is why the church is so confused. Now, here's what happened when they translated the King James into English from the Greek, the Greek word daimonizomai, which is translated from Greek to English. The English translation is possessed with devils. The actual Greek word, means to be under the power of a demon has nothing to do with ownership now let me set the record straight can a christian be possessed no, no. they can't because possessed means ownership okay Come let me on. just set the record they still say i think they cannot the devil don't. cannot own you you can have demons listen to what i'm about to say die pagani said demons don't bother us only cessationists bro can we make that I, a shirt and go to heaven because your demons are not going to go with you. Um, this is the same thing of people that I deal with in high level occultism that say, I sold my soul to the devil. You cannot sell your soul to the devil. You don't own your soul and the devil doesn't own your soul. You can't sell something you don't own belongs to God. So there's no such thing as selling your soul to the devil. Um, there's also no such thing as a Christian being possessed because the devil doesn't own believers. He can't own a believer. The devil actually doesn't own anything. So yeah, crickets. Name one thing the devil owns, nothing. But let me just give you, I'm a shotgun bunch of verses to you that give biblical evidence that a Christian could be under the power, not possessed, but under the power of a demon. Mark 139, Jesus went from synagogue to synagogue, casting out demons. Matthew 16, Jesus told Peter, Satan, get behind me, not speaking to Peter. John 13, the Bible says Satan entered Judas. But here's, a, here's one, 
Acts chapter five. I'm going to give you it word for word, okay? And you guys can take it whatever you want to take it. Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled your heart yeah. to lie to the Holy Ghost let's, and let's, keep can, back? Can, okay. you, can you stop there? I know, I know you're in a flow. I know yeah. you're in a flow. Yeah, yeah, but, go ahead, but, go ahead. but that that passage, when you when you draw, when you broke that down on the video, this is a relatively new video you just you just covered. When you broke yeah. down that passage, because a lot of the fo uh, folks are gonna say this is before the resurrection, this is before the Holy Spirit came. But when you shared that passage, I was like, man, that is the strong. What would you say is the greatest miracle? Salvation, when someone gets saved, they go from death to life, and now they're going to go from spending forever in hell to forever in heaven. Salvation is definitely, to me, the greatest miracle. Strongest argument right there. Uh, in as far as something happening in someone's life, if like healing, deliverance, salvation, being born again, being born again, salvation is, is the biggest miracle. The New Testament in the Acts, in the Church of Acts, where you see someone that's... Cr uh, apparently a Christian, yeah. Apparently yeah. spiritual. Apparently a Christian, and 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 is accused of having uh, demonization in that moment. Oh, he believes Christians can have demons. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest number one thing. And I put my position out there very clear: mm -hmm. Christians can have demons. No, they can't be possessed. So it's always just. Tell me why my skin looks like the color of a demon in this video right here. The same same thing he said yeah. this and that's not what he meant he said this and i'm just like okay well i i teach basically the bible or the new testament doesn't definitively say whether someone's oppressed or possessed it's a, it's a, like an english translation Demonized, so uh, i always say it's demonized is the king is the um original greek which yep. it, you know is a poor translation when you take demon Someone said, all this documentary has done is increase my respect and honor for you. All this done is prove that you've been sticking to the gospel since day one. Thank you, Taryn, for that positive comment. I'm not going to tell everyone, go comment something positive on this video. Let's drown out the haters. But I appreciate that comment. You know what I'm saying? Demonized to possess with devils. Like I, I teach. I promise you guys the negative comments don't offend me or upset me whatsoever. Random people on the internet I'll never meet saying that they don't agree with me. I mean, we got to be... You got to be, you know, that can't bug you if you're going to be online. Let's just put it that way. Christians can't be. And also, I'm going to, we got a, a couple more minutes and I'm going to get off pretty much right after this is over. And I'm interested to see the very end and how he ties it all together. But yeah, I got to get off soon because I promised to do my, something with my kids. Possessed, but I also teach possession is a English word that was not found in the original Greek. Now, aside from the flack that Isaiah gets for talking about Christians being able to be demonized, he, and he's right. I mean, I do get flack for that by cessationists. He gets in quite a bit of hot water for stating that signs must accompany the gospel presentation. Again, more flack I get from cessationists. No charismatics or people in my circle give me flack for any of this except for those that don't believe in it. In fact, he says this outright on a few different podcasts that he hosts. Ryan, what's up, bro? And you know the answer to that is, you know. Or bullshit. content that he makes. And while he tries to explain that even if those things didn't happen, he would still believe, other things he says contradicts that very statement. Is it fair to say that some of your experience drove some of your methodology of ministry? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think every every single person that says that experience doesn't matter is lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. Every single person is shaped and dictated by experiences they go through in life. Yeah. To say like, oh, experience doesn't matter. Now, when it comes to the... Someone said, if this is the worst he can find out about Isaiah, Isaiah is a saint. Thank you, Theology bro. and now you guys listen. You guys don't need to shower me with positive comments, okay? It's how all good. we look at the word, of course. I love what Dr. Brown says. Dr. Brown says, if I prayed for a thousand people and not one of them got healed, mm -hmm. I would still believe that God's a healer because mm -hmm. the word of God says it. I Fire. I will never base my theology off of experience, but experience definitely has to do with your methodology, mm -hmm. how you preach. But when it comes to like the like real theology, like Dr. Brown says. My theology is not based on experience. Mm -hmm. My experiences are because of what the word of God says. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys say, well, you really need to cut up the word to get mm -hmm. it to say that. Sure, no, sure, sure, you sure. need to get cut up the word to not to not see deliverance, yeah. to not see miracles. Yeah. Like you got to really stretch to yeah, not well, believe this stuff happens today. In the Bible, Jesus said the signs and wonders validate the message is true. They Again, this is no longer on YouTube with Catherine Crick, but I don't know if you pulled it up again to, to show my collaboration with Catherine Crick or I think maybe to pull this Validate the here. sermon, the preaching that is the true gospel. And John 10, I'm Jesus not trying said, to question you don't believe me, or anything believe like that, the miracles. And so that's why anyone that is, one, oh, this or that about me or about you or about Daniel Adams or about any of the people that we have on, any of the people we run with and we all kind of are going in that same lane, I'm going like, we have this evidence. Also, you guys all know that I'm no longer connected with Daniel Adams. So again, I just find it weird if he did all this research on me and dug so deep to find engagement videos with me and Alyssa, he 100% has to know I'm no longer connected with Catherine Crick or Daniel Adams, but he puts in a clip of me with Catherine Crick, which has been deleted off of YouTube. 
talking about Daniel Adams and me and her be, him being connected. So I don't know. To me, this is probably the only part of the documentary out of the hour and 23 minutes so far that I'm like thumbs down because uh, it seems a little deceptive when he knows I'm not connected with Catherine Crick and I'm also not connected with Daniel Adams anymore. But he finds a clip that puts all three of us together because he knows a certain side. I won't name them because I've already named them enough can't stand Catherine or Daniel Adams. So he wants to, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm, I don't want to appeal to his motive. I'm just saying, I just think that's kind of it's of God moving of the power of God. Meanwhile, the, these religious people, they have nothing but arguments like, and the person with experience is never at the mercy of someone with an argument. And so we we're believing tonight, guys, that there's going to be an experience in your life that you're not going to go to the school of this or school of that you're going to go to the school of experience because God really wants to touch your life tonight. God really wants to change you tonight. God really wants to bring breakthrough um, in your life tonight. And so I love it. The deliverances, you know, I, I yeah, this is charisma podcast audio, because again, I've taken down the YouTube videos because of her covering. I don't agree with her covering. I think there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. And so yeah, that's it. Nothing more to say. I see it like this as long, especially with your testimony. Mine is we didn't, I didn't ask to cast out devils. I didn't ask to, yeah. I want to make someone manifest. I saw uh, I do have another clip saying this in my book of Romans teaching where I talk about where Paul says in Romans I did these things and these were the evidence or these basically proved I preached the full gospel I'm paraphrasing it majorly because I'm in a rush here to be done to um to go do what I need to do with my daughters but yeah that's uh there's other clips of me saying that oh that there was a need and I'm like I'm gonna fill the need I'm gonna be the person there and by default it became people come people get delivered people get healed and sadly I really feel that there's a change coming to the body of Christ where it's going to be more abnormal to not do deliverance than to do deliverance. Hopefully. So it's no longer going to be, oh, you're weird, you do deliverance. It's going to be, you're weird, you don't do deliverance? Yes. Like, you guys don't cast out devils? You guys don't heal... Again, I mean, he's leaving this clip on long in big bold letters, podcast with Catherine Crick, who he knows pretty much every reformed cessationist just cannot stand her I'm, I'm just saying the way he lumps me in, i don't i think that's a little bit unfair the sick like how do you guys prove the gospel if jesus healed the sick and cast out yeah here i say it again here this is from my book of romans teaching demons literally everywhere he went why don't you think as a follower of his you shouldn't be doing that why is it okay for so many pastors to not perform signs and wonders why is it okay for pastors to preach against miracles today it's time to let the holy spirit empower our lives and begin to perform signs and wonders so that we can fully present Amen. the gospel there's no getting around it without signs and wonders we have not fully presented the gospel and the signs and wonders are the convincing element I just find it so hard to convince people God's alive and well I don't I literally don't find it hard when they see deliverance when they see miracles when they get healed when God moves in their life they're convinced that God is real but if you don't have miracles there's no convincing factor so that's the scary part about powerless Christianity that is propagated in America as you lose the convincing factor. And guess what? You're I didn't say there's anything wrong with Daniel Adams. I just said I'm not connected to Daniel Adams anymore. So that's all I said. You little play once a year is not going to convince the world God's alive. Both of these issues, along with a number of others, come up time and time again in videos of people critiquing Isaiah. Videos of people that he would simply call heresy hunters that go after his. Yes, they are heresy hunters. Their literal entire channel is built upon tearing other ministers down, calling other ministers false, calling other ministers out. Everybody's wrong but them. They're 100% heresy hunters, and the ministry that they claim to have is not biblical. There's no such thing as the your only thing you do is call other ministers out. It's not, it's not biblical. Theology and what he teaches. However, the growth doesn't stop for Isaiah. 2022 brings... Another one with Catherine Crick. This video isn't even on my channel. Much of the same in regard. Why are we out using the same clip again? to growth. Isaiah's ministry is primarily online now. He does occasionally speak at other churches, but a majority of his time is spent online. You can take a look at a lot of his previous videos. And one of the things that does often get overlooked is that Isaiah has gone through a number of books. Thank you. We got three minutes left of the video. I'm glad he mentioned this. No one ever mentions that I go verse by verse through the Bible and I'm trying to finish the New Testament. No one talks about this. Thank you for mentioning this. So the this is like, takes so much time and energy and effort, months and months, tens and tens and tens of hours, hundreds of hours, and no one ever mentions this. You'll never find one Heresy Hunter channel say Isaiah teaches the Bible verse by verse. You just won't find it because it doesn't fit their narrative. Bible verse by verse 
teaching through them. The book of Colossians, the book of Philippians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Romans, just to name a few. And, and the book of Revelation right there too. But I really appreciate him saying this because no one ever, never, never talks about this. Oftentimes, nobody talks about these. Along with this, he continues the Q&As that he started at the very beginning of launching his channel, as well as a podcast called Let's Talk Supernatural. All of this has left him quite busy, and very rarely does he take speaking engagements. Fill out a booking form on our website. Pray, I'll pray about it, but I'll just be honest. The chances are slim. I'm only traveling once a month, and uh, I used to travel pretty much every weekend, and I'm not doing that anymore, so... It's not easy to get me to come. It would have to really be God speak to me, but I do pray over every request. So fill out a request on the website to start, and then we can go from there. His YouTube channel continues to grow by an average of 30,000 a month with one huge spike in November of 2020. That was a shorts that went viral there. Now, I don't know what causes this spike, but I do know it is this a short that went viral month that he finally hits 500,000 subscribers. That's 400,000 subscribers in just two years. And the growth of subscribers and his views say basically the same, right under 5 million a month. Now, the reason that this is important is because this kind of growth does not go unnoticed. Isaiah, before, was very much relegated to who he could get to within the churches, who knew his name, where he was speaking, and the regions in which he spoke. But this is an entirely different ballgame. In fact, if you know of Isaiah Saldivar at all, it is likely because you came to know of him anywhere between 2020 and 2022. And the things he's known for over these years, the videos that he makes, are the same things he's known for in 2023. The growth on YouTube in 2020, as well as other social media platforms, basically establishes Isaiah as a primarily online ministry. The skyrocketing growth online seems to lead to Isaiah and his team to expand out his studio so that they can now host guests and have more professional looking setups. And we're super excited about the new studio. If you guys don't know the story, we like, I think the end of December, we decided we wanted to build a studio for this next year and literally everything happened so fast. We were going to do a GoFundMe, but somebody heard we were going to do a GoFundMe before we launched it, while emailed we us. It. Yeah. While we were talking about it. They emailed us and were like, God told us to pay for it. So they ended up sending us $30,000 paid for tons Someone's of like Gatorade AirPods. Like in my AirPod case, my kids got me. Oh, you can't see it. It's a Sour Patch Kid case, AirPod case. Look at equipment, all the cameras, all the lights. And then it ended up being total like 60 to 70,000, which I'll make a video all about that. And so they tremendously blessed us with everything that they put into the studio and things like that. So it's going to be really, really good. Spending upwards of sixty to seventy thousand dollars on a new studio, thirty thousand dollars of which came from an anonymous donor, Isaiah and his team basically built out the manifestation of what he had already begun to do when he launched his channel back in 2020. Now, instead of Zoom interviews, the Revival Lifestyle podcast is now a Joe Rogan level quality production with high quality. Let me just say, way better than Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan has like the worst production quality, the worst cameras, the worst quality, the worst studio. So, uh, yeah. I think my studio looks way better quality wise than Joe Rogan's video production and live streaming capabilities. And there are also two other major events Isaiah participates in. Isaiah has been a part of two separate movies on deliverance and revival, both the things that Isaiah champions on his YouTube channel. The first is Come Out in Jesus' Name, and it was released March 13th of 2023. And Isaiah seems to get a bump of subs from this movie release as well, just as he did before with his TV appearances. The second movie... Yeah, I don't usually really know. I don't really get a. I don't feel a bump from any of the TV or movie stuff. It's usually from um a, a podcast episode going viral or a shorts going viral. Some of the videos I've posted that have gone viral will get me like twenty thousand subs from one video. Some of the live streams will all get twenty, thirty thousand from one video. So if one video goes viral in a week or two or a month, you can see a massive shoot up. Media like movies, television shows, appearances on other channels, they do very, very little to your growth. Like very, very little. Movie that he is a part of is the Domino Revival, which was released in October 23rd of 2023. And if you haven't seen both movies, come out in Jesus' name and the Domino Revival. Go watch both those movies. They're really good. They both were in theaters and now you can get them on like Amazon Prime and stuff like that. Domino Revival is not out yet digitally, but it will be soon. And as before, seems to get a bump in subscriptions on YouTube because of it. And that brings us up to now. There's no question that Isaiah Saldivar has an enormous influence online, an influence that he developed and grew over time in actual ministry. 
His influence has only grown and continues to grow as he does different events with the other demon slayers, but within the growing movement of deliverance and the questions that come with it. Isaiah seems to have answers to the issues that now plague the world. Why are so many people addicted? Why are so many people anxious? Why are so many people concerned and worried and scared? Well, Isaiah and the other demon slayers seem to have the answer to this question. That answer is that you are very likely demonized. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this, is Isaiah Saldivar a faithful minister of the gospel? Is what he teaches in line with scripture? Does he contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints? Holding fast to the virgin birth, Jesus' perfect life lived, yes, his death yes. in our place for our sins, yes. the bodily resurrection, yes. his ascension into heaven, and his yes. coming again to judge yes. the living and yes. the dead. The only thing we can do currently is watch Isaiah's ministry, and as the Bereans did to Paul in Acts, compare what he says against the scriptures, and to pray for him, that he knows the gospel and he proclaims it to the best of his ability for the glory of God and the growth of his kingdom. And in that moment, I said that, again, an atheist didn't believe the audible voice of God. We're not talking about a small voice. We're not wow. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen. That was well done. That was well done. I, I, uh, let me try to gather my words here. I don't know. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was well done. There was a couple parts. I was kind of like, uh, it felt a little bit. Why put that there? But I will say this. Thank you for the guy that made this honest youth pastor. I know a lot of work got put into that. Took me down memory lane. I'm very impressed with all the information he was able to come up with. I don't, I don't feel like you, like I was getting attacked. I don't feel like he was like digging for something. I did find it a little bit weird that he did all the research. He's obviously watched tens of hours, hundreds maybe of my content. And he put in the only couple podcast clips that have been deleted off my channel and tied me in. And that that was a little bit weird, but um, yeah, I mean, he watched a lot of my stuff. So he knew obviously those had been deleted, but I thought it was really good. It took me down memory lane. It still blows my mind. I still feel like I'm living a dream. I would say at the end where he said, you know, the question is, is Isaiah agree on these core doctrines? Obviously, yes. Every single one of those I teach, I believe, I agree with. Uh, sadly, I'm labeled a heretic by many cessationists and reformed because I believe in the gifts. I believe in miracles and uh, it's a secondary issue. If you don't believe in miracles, gifts, deliverance, that's fine. It's not a primary issue, but a lot of times we divide over secondary issues, even though they're secondary issues, which is fine. You're never going to have everybody like you. People are always going to say stuff about you regardless. And uh, again, I'm not telling you go put a positive comment on the video. Nothing like that. Just my wife's not allowed to go read the comments. She's not allowed on any comments because she just can't handle negative comments but i thought it was great i don't know what you guys thought a lot of you said you loved it um for those in the comments that were saying negative things on his video saying like azio thinks it's all about him i mean yeah i mean the testimony videos were about me if someone says share your testimony for an hour the story is about your testimony of what god's done in your life and uh this documentary was about me the making of a minister isaiah saldivar so yeah of course it's like an hour and a half video about me it's literally what the documentary is so those are kind of my thoughts all over the place. Yes, Alyssa's banned from reading comments. Again, uh, this was made by Honest you I believe it's Honest Youth Pastor. I keep saying the Honest, but I think it's Honest Youth Pastor. And uh, yeah, I appreciate him making. I appreciate him making it. I didn't make the documentary for those asking. I wasn't a part of it. He made the documentary. He's made one on Mike Todd and Stephen Furtick, and it felt unbiased. Again, again, there was a couple little things where I'm like, uh why put that in there? But it is what it is. You know, he's encapsulating 13 years in an hour and 29 minutes. So awesome guys. I'm going to jump off here. This is the last stream of 2023. It's been an amazing year. I don't have all the stats for you guys. I know we're over 200 million views this year, which is incredible. What God has done. I'll post some infograph about all the people we've reached and kind of like everything that's going on. Very important. The next stream I'll be doing is January 1st. We are doing seven days of prayer. So I want you guys to be a part of this. The schedule's on my website. I want to get at least 3,000 people praying with us every single day. Monday, January 1st, 6 o'clock. Tuesday, 6 o'clock. Wednesday, 6 o'clock. Thursday, 6 o'clock. Friday, prayer at noon. Friday night, 6 o'clock podcast. Saturday, prayer meeting at 6 o'clock. Sunday, prayer meeting at 6 o'clock. Monday, Monday teaching. Tuesday, podcast. We have nine days straight of streaming. 10, 10 total streams in nine days. Please be a part of this, okay? Seven days of prayer, 
All you have to do is jump on my Facebook or YouTube and you can pray with us to start the year. I would really appreciate it and it'd be amazing. Okay, guys, no ending screen tonight. No dancing, Carl. My kids have been waiting. I'm 35 minutes over right now. So they are waiting. I can hear them. I'm jumping off. Thank you guys again for joining with me on this video. I thought it was awesome reacting to it, watching it. Took me down memory lane and just cool. I pray God will use it to, to reach people for his honor and his glory. All praise, all glory to Jesus. He's the reason we're doing all this. Without him, I would be who knows where. I would probably wouldn't even be alive anymore. So all glory, all honor to Jesus. And yeah, praise to his name. And that will be Pacific time. Yes. January 1st through the 7th. All the times are on my website. Is slash schedule. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. See you guys. God bless. See you January 1st. What a great year it's been. And I just can't say it enough. Thank you guys for partnering and all that. And we also are going to have weekly prayer meetings in 2024 for monthly partners. So if you're a monthly partner, weekly prayer meetings coming in 2024 together on the Zoom. Can't wait. Love to see it. Love to see you guys there. Bye. Good night. I don't even know how to end this because we have an ending screen.